And welcome to our game here with myself, Shane Stapleton, joined by Michael Verney, Kevin Walsh, John O'Mahony, Seamus Moynihan, and we'll also have Liam Kearns on soon. We're here at on Pucon in Galway, previewing Galway against Kerry in the All Ireland Football Final coming up this Sunday, sponsored by Heineken. We have a great lineup of guests, I'm sure you'll agree. And uh, we're going to be doing a Q&A with the crowd later on if people want to get involved. So uh, it's going to, be, going to be a great night. So starting off, Kevin Walsh with yourself. You brought some of these uh, Galway players to an All-Ireland semi-final four years ago. Can you just sum up the excitement in Galway at the moment? Uh, Galway BFM called out to our place at 6 o'clock this evening. So there's flags everywhere. Um, it was a long time waiting since this man brought us to the, the Holy Grail. So... Uh, look, it's, it's just the, the kids, they're, they're, they're excited, I suppose, with all the matches coming thick and thin every two weeks now, compared to years ago, it was a month of break, they just want to go to matches and matches, and the, all the youngsters looking for the hill now, which is great as well, where they can take off their shirts and fire it around and look, be a macho man on the hill. So, look, it's full of excitement, and it's just great to be part of it. John, what's it like? You're obviously a manager trying to insulate players back in the day, in the late 90s, the early noughties. What's it like now looking at in just as a supporter? Do you, can you get lost in it all now? All the excitement around the county, like it's well, unreal. There's a serious well, buzz around. I'm definitely enjoying it more than I did then because you were, you were in the bubble then and you were watching every everything and tr try to get the, the guys ready for the big day. But I really enjoy the, the, the build-up, but the one thing I'd say, coming from Mayo, the build-up in, in, in Galway and the build-up in Mayo is totally different. They only started getting excited in Galway about the week before in All-Ireland, whereas, you know, they get excited in Mayo f weeks beforehand. And uh, I remember last year, uh, about three weeks before they played the final, just out they, had, they had won the first semi-final and uh, driving over Mayo and like, uh, I thought there was a, uh, some fellas uh, pictures were on every poll. It was like whether we were going for election, like. So uh, I haven't seen any of that in Galway, and I think there's a, a nice calmness, and they're coming in as total underdogs. So it's 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 it's, it's, it's the hype is starting now, but I think it, you know the players. I, I would imagine and I, I saw a few of our own Salt Hill lads came down to training last week. They were training on different nights and just to to say hello, and they were seemed to be very calm and about the whole thing. So I think the mood is good. Great to have you here, Seamus. Obviously, after coming a, a long spin up from Kerry. First things first. The word Yera is banned here tonight. There'll be no Yeras or anything like that. No Yeras. No plum awesomeness or anything here. You're not going to pull the wool over the gall of people's eyes here tonight. But uh, just on the mood down in Kerry, I was down in Killarney last week for the All Ireland presser. Um, and Jack O'Connor was trying to keep it quiet almost and try and keep a lid on all the different sideshows. But there is a huge excitement and a huge expectation building in Kerry. 100% Michael, uh, yeah, look, I suppose we're no sooner, just after coming off the roller coaster after beating Dublin in what was a, a real a exciting game and uh, you're trying to organise yourself again for an All-Ireland Final, look, um, obviously people are delighted to be back in an All-Ireland Final, they've waited a long time, uh, to, I suppose 2019 they played Dublin, albeit had an opportunity the first day against Dublin, had a great chance, especially when Johnny Cooper was, 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 uh, was sent to the line, but we didn't capitalise on it and I knew myself going down that day that our opportunity it was was gone and even though we showed up and came back up the following day Dublin totally controlled that game and showed the experience and the and the class that they had so look we're delighted to be back and obviously we're delighted we beat Kerry or beat Dublin in the semi-final the last day albeit by a, a wonder kick by Sean Shea in the last it obviously it was going to extra time only for that but look we're back in the final and uh, the sad reality, absolutely nothing won, and we're playing, uh, you know, a Galway team that we know are full, full of, full of quality, and uh, and we, we we know that if we take them for granted in any shape or form, you're going to be punished 100. percent Seamus, you were part of that famous Tralee IT team along with Parik Joyce and Michael Donnellan. Can you tell us about that era and playing with those fellas? Yeah, um, you know, I I, I kind of did things a bit arseways in the sense that I went to UCC for four years, did a degree in science and should have gone out working, but instead I went to Chile. I was asked to go back and do a, a master's back in Chile. I'd say it was kind of a 
a manufactured masters to be fair um, mm. back there at the time and when I went in in 97 Padraig Joyce was actually doing computer studies there so I got to know Padraig uh, through training first and obviously after a couple of games we got to know each other inside in the bar having a couple of points uh, he was always a good man to throw down a, a point of Guinness and uh, but Joyce he was a quality player and I, I, I could never understand that year how he wasn't involved with the Galway team um, I, I, I can remember in 97 he gave an exhibition against UCD above in, in Belfield. He, he was just kicking points against the wind for fun, uh, left and right, just throwing him over the bar. And he, and he was, he just, he exhumed that kind of confidence. It was just straight up to the bar, a ball, and just throw it over the bar. So I, I, we were really surprised. But to be fair to Joyce, he was a great character. You called down to his house on a, after a match or even a, a, during the day and there was Shea McLarty and there was Mick Clarty from Karna staying in the house as well and uh, they loved their fries anyway, I can tell you one thing. They, uh, they never they, told me. Yeah, well, they, they, they were absolutely putting the rashers and the sashes into the frying pan and it was full with fry takes oil. I never saw it. They were swimming the rashers inside there. But uh, I, I just don't know how they actually moved at all after it. But look, to be fair, when they trained, they trained hard and when they played, they played hard and both on and off the field. But to be fair, quality players, we Again, Michael then in 98, Michael came down and was just this pocket rocket who, who, who I saw playing at minor level, but to see him in the flesh and to see him move, I would say Liam himself and Palade would have been very similar players in the sense the burst the pace that they had was absolutely unbelievable uh, and Michael took the place a lot that time, but they were great characters. I tell you one great story, in 98 when we won the Sigerson, um, we beat uh, Jarnstown in the final, but we went into Horns Bar after the game and all our family were there, Paddy, uh, Padraig's father was there, and the Donlands were there. And within 20 minutes, they were all gone, but they were all after getting vouchers for drinks. So before we knew it, we were like two old women inside the bazaar. We'd around 100 tickets of pints, uh, for, for tip for pints. So myself and Joycey, Donlan, around four or five other fellas decided to stay on. We stayed in the horns for as long as we could. But on the way down, we were eating the brogue. We said we'd have a pint in every... Um, bar on the way down on the right hand side which we, we tried for as long as we could but we went into a bar called the Mal Tavern and Dean would probably know it there's actually two doors into the Mal so we went in one door and I said we had one quick drink and there was a band playing inside there I don't know they're playing Tin Lizzy uh, a song from Tin Lizzy I'd say and uh, we walked out again and Joycey actually walked out the door he walked two meters and he went in right again came back into the same bar and turned around and said, Jesus, don't hear you playing the music in the same, the, the bands are playing the same music in all the bloody bars, he said. <laughs> so he didn't realize he actually went back into the same bar, but that was the character he was. He was, he was great fun, but extremely competitive when he came to playing football and when he put his mind to it, he was the best in the business. Can I just ask you on Porrick as well, what's it like when you know a fella so well to end up marking him in an All-Ireland final and all the talk is about your duel potentially deciding the game? Do you have a laugh at the start of the game? Do you talk to each other? What's, what's that like? Yeah, I know. I think when you cross the white, uh, white line in the sand, you just have to get on with the game and move on with it. But funny enough, in that game, I, I'd say I might have marked Padraig for, in, <coughs> overall, in the two games, I wouldn't, mightn't have marked him for 15 or 20 minutes because Padraig spent most of his time out on the, on the farty. And uh, so I, I, I might have marked him for maybe 20 minutes over that whole period. But uh, look, at the end of the day, he went to business, I went to business after the game and after the replay, we met up above and we, we had a few sociables, but uh, we both went out to win and, you know, look, that's the way, that's the way it went. But as I said, we're, we're, we're good friends since. I've been texting Padraig all the way through. I text him during the week there to wish him the very best to look. You didn't and, mean it though, really. Well, to, to a point, I'd have to say one thing. I hope Kerry obviously win on Sunday. I'm a Kerry man, and we're going 100% obviously to go and win it. But if we do lose to Galway, I'd be really delighted for Porrick Joyce to win, and I didn't mean that. John, wh why was Porrick Joyce not called up till 1998? There's, a, there's an accusation there that he should have been called up earlier. Yeah, well, I was glad when I got the job that he hadn't been called up earlier. Uh, but I was, I suppose I was aware of all these, uh, what were coming into their veterans at the time, that there were, uh, well, I would say more, uh, you know, it, it actually, the seed of what I did in Galway was sown w in, with Leitrim, because we beat Galway twice. And we had basically 300 adult players in Leitrim and if you can win a Connacht Championship with that and when I come in to commiserate the t couple of times we did beat them and I'd look around this dressing room and see what was there 
I kind of, in my own mind, uh, you'd be saying, geez, if these applied like, like the other one, what, anything could happen. And then obviously through my teaching in St. 80s and getting hammered by Jarlitz and the great 94 team, I was aware of the Porrick Joyce's and the Derek Savage's. Well, he, he went to Pats, but uh, Divley's and all those. So, uh, like, I was privileged, if you like, to, to, to have those young lads coming in with experienced players who had only won one Connacht Championship in 11 years. And the Sean Ogle, the Pairs, the Mangans, the Kevins, the Jazz, the, all of those people were incredible footballers. And the chemistry between the two groups uh, gelled automatically. So I didn't have much to do. Like, I, I, I used to hear Kevin saying to Mikey Donlan, these fellas, you do the running and I'll organise things around here, you know, so. And, and, and it was, uh, it was unbelievable, the, the if you like, the, the cocktail that the, of the youngsters coming in and, and, and the players that were there. And I suppose the motto, I know Parik Joyce said when he was appointed manager, I want to win everything the first year in All-Ireland. I didn't take that view at all. I, I, I kind of said it within the dressing room. I knew when we were coming out of Castle Bar and 24th May 1998 that we had a fair chance, but we, we says we'll try and have this All-Ireland won before anyone realises it, you know. So when you're talking about, you know, beating them with Leitrim, and then uh, I read an interview with you not so long ago when you were talking about the importance of sports psychology and the influence of the Lions Tour in 1997. Can you explain how you uh, tried to bring that to the Galway group? Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, obviously, I, I managed my own 89 to the All-Ireland, and the big thing I felt at the time, Connacht football was in the doldrums. I mean, the chance, and, and Ulster football as well, ironically, it was always between the, the Dublin and the Kerrys uh, for the most part, and Mead came in there a, a bit as well, and, and Cork obviously were there. But, for, for, but it, Connacht and, and Ulster, if you met in a semi final, there was no backdoor that time, there was a chance of getting to a final, and in 89, uh, we decided that we'd throw every, the kitchen sink at it because the belief systems I felt in Connacht needed a boost. We got a, 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 a guy who knew nothing about football but knew about psychology, Bill Cogan, Kevin. Uh, so we had him in Mayo, I had him in Leitrim and I had him in Galway. Uh, and effectively it was to, 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 to change the narrative. Like when I started managing way back, if you won a Connick Championship, your job was safe for the following year. I want to, I, 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 you know, and I felt the quality of players when I came into Galway uh, were such that that they, they should be aiming higher. They had huge respect for Mayo, what Mayo had done in 96 and 97. So I says, look at lads, the only way you're going to get any glory is to, is to bring the cup home, and the Julie did. What changed, Kevin, when John came in in 98? Uh, we've all probably watched a year till Sunday and seen some of the fairly barbaric training that you went through, but was it a mentality kind of thing that changed in 98, or what was it exactly? Uh, look, I suppose it was, I have to say, organisation number one. <clears throat> it was, uh, this man knew what he was doing nine months later. I remember I hadn't played the year before, and I just joined you, John, at the time, if we had a chat, and you had said to me, Give another go and i said i won't and anyway i was ready to give it in and in fairness to you convinced otherwise but i remember i didn't play that year with galway had a few injuries and i ended up managing my club and that summer actually had one of the best summer club games you were playing at them and i went really really well in the in the club and this man brought me in we decided to go in and i remember the connacht team were playing the railway cup at the time and they'd asked me to go and play midfield or it was and you said he says to me so there we are, Kevin, if you don't mind, and we'll explode you in May in Castle Bar. <laughs> and that was back in November. So that was the kind of mindset that this man had. But was, the organization skills just completely turned around. You mentioned about Bill Cogan, uh, the dietary, everything, his backroom team. It was just a completely turned around completely. And I suppose preparation breeds confidence. And I suppose confidence breeds success. So this man had the preparation first and the confidence built. And again, we were looking at John, probably the young fellas came through. Oh, a few yeah. older the, fellas the, stayed on the, and the mix was good. The quality that I had was, you know, you asked me what was the most quality team that I managed. It was the Galway team. So that, that had to be a part of it. It's, it's, it's good when you, have, when you have all the tools in the toolbox, you know. Can you just talk to me, Kevin, from a player's perspective? Before, I think it was before the All-Ireland Final in 98, was it? the room the lights in the room were darkened and you were watching living with the lions i believe clips from that uh, documentary and then all of a sudden i think keith wood landed into the top of the room yeah. what what was that like from a, from a player's point of view and when did you even notice he was there and could you believe he was there 
I suppose it was, it was a more of a shock than anything else. Um, maybe when we saw him coming through, we realised we'd made so, part of the big time. We, 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 were, we weren't used to have even crowds coming to Galway games at the time. I think when John came in, like even the All Ireland semi final in '95, um, I mean, we, the support was very poor at the time. I think we had only two and a half thousand people in Club Park. And I suppose that needs to be built up as well. We'd already lost maybe two times to Leitrim. And again, that Leitrim team were well prepared and they're actually quite a good team. I think even 95, when we won Connacht, we were lucky to beat Leitrim. Um, by a point, a late, a late point. Um, but again, I just suppose when the likes of that, it just showed you that were this, this man had gone to uh, ahead of his time. It was about bringing whatever he needed to instill confidence in us. But it was a bit of a shock to see him walking through the door. But it was, I suppose it, it kind of sent that message out that the, it was professional. So. Yeah, I, I think the, the story behind it really was that I, I, we, we were going away on a weekend in early May. And I was trying. I was sitting down with Bill Cogan actually, and says, "You know, I, I just happened to turn on the telly, and I was watching that that Lions thing, and Keith Wood played a big part in it. And we basically used a lot of that tape, you know, because it showed the preparation they were in South Africa and, and all of that, and the way that they raised the standards and all that kind of thing. So just, that, that that was done in May. So basically." When we got before the All Ireland, I I said, how can we link? You know, we have been on a journey here, but the big one is to come in the final. And how can we link the two? So I says, maybe just if I could get Keith Wood because he had a big part in that. Like, so I hadn't a clue where how I'd get a hold of him. Uh, so I tried to get him before the semi final, and I rang the I, ra I was looking numbers the, that time those phone books, but I couldn't get any any number. So I rang the local guard the station. I knew he was from Killaloo or Ballina, Killaloo or whatever, and I said, look. At, Anyone, and I said, "Will you give me the number?" The guard told me that his mother was living down the down the street, and he said, "I'll I'll um, I'll give you the I'll give you the." Uh, I asked him for the number. But he says she might get frightened if she got a call from somebody she didn't know. So I says, "Okay, will you tell her what I'm looking for that I want to talk to uh, Keith?" So the the. Within 10 minutes, I had a call from Keith in, in um, London. He was playing with Harlequins, I think, at the time. And uh, I, he, he, he just couldn't come before the semi-final, which was good as it turned out. But he says, look, if you get to the final, I'll, I'll do it for you. So what, what the, these lads didn't know, I says, look, we better create a bit of a surprise here. Like. So we, we, we kind of were in talking at the team meeting and going over where we started. We had shots with Pat Comer. He had shots of, of us meeting back in May. And while that was happening, they were going on chatting about it. I slipped out and Keith was to take a flight that morning. He was to be outside the hotel at a certain time. What he didn't realize is that he got, he got a suspected uh, broken jaw the day before for Harlequins. But in fairness to him, the club wanted him to go to get it checked out. He had given a commitment and we, we, we turned on the lights and the boys, the boys, but he was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant, you know. Do you have any memory, Kevin, of anything they might have said in that game? Do you have any memory of anything that Keith might have said that day or did anything resonate with you? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> I actually don't remember it at all. But, um, I, I know, look at Some people maybe didn't need it, but some did as well, you know. <laughs> Actually, one of the things he said, I remember what, what it, one of the things he said is that at the time, um, Ireland used to be great in the first 50 minutes of some matches, but they'd, they'd run out of steam, like, and they'd be baiting the heads of each other in the dressing room, and what he was emphasised, the calmness, of the need for calmness in the dressing room, and, and uh, not, not, as he said, he put it nicely, he says, not to get over aroused in the dressing room before the game. Seamus, is that something that you would have had in the Kerry dressing room? Or, you know, I mean, when you started out, and I think you were a schoolboy in 1991 when you joined, then there was the Clare situation in 92. It's not like you were on top of the pile at that stage. It was the golden years, and maybe this was Kerry trying to reboot and go again. But how did you, what was your mindset like in the dressing room, and what was it that was holding you back for those few years? The early, in the early 90s. Like, in your it, early yeah. years. Yeah. Well, yeah, I look, I, I, unfortunately, I went, fortunately or unfortunately, I landed in, I, I did my leaving certain, I came in in 92, we got beaten by Clare in the Munster final, uh, and like it was a fair baptism of fire, I was thrown into the middle of the field, and, uh, but I was, uh, I was just thrown around the place like a rag doll, to be fair, uh, we were after winning the All Ireland with the same that year, but it was just going from completely from down here, from down here up to a, a higher level of physicality altogether, but 
to be fair, Kerry had Jack Oful forward. We still had a, with Morris, we'd, we'd still a, a good quality team, but the mix was wrong. And, and to be fair, Clare were the better team on the day. But from 92 up all the way up to 95, it was a horrendous period of time to be a Kerry player. And I can remember actually one time we got lost to Cork walking down and Connor Carney was the midfielder at the time. Guy from Brick Rangers, Abby Dorney. Not, there was actually four or five of them at the time. There were, it's a hurling club and there were four or five of them on the, on the panel at the time. But we were walking down Clarny and and a, a man walked past him and spat into his face. And look, it's, it's just a horrendous time. We just went into the bar and had a couple of points and there was no reaction or whatnot. But we, it, was, it was the lowest of the low at the time, really, to be a part of the Kerry team. And, and it, was, it, just, it was a hard time. And I suppose we have to realise that Kerry had come off what was such a, an, an unbelievable period of time from, from 75 all the way up to 86. And, and there was a generation of players lost, and there's no doubting that. People who were never going to get in. They're, you're not going to replace George Power. You're not going to replace the full forward line of Mikey Sheehy, Barmerliston, and, and John Egan over on the far side. However good you were, you were not going to get into that clique. And there was a generation of players lost. And unfortunately, for that 10 years, there was there was a major catch up. And, you know, in fairness to the county board, they did catch up. They got one and all out in 94 in the minors, <laughs> but it took a long time. And ultimately, Ogie and Mickey Ned were thrown under the bus as managers. They didn't have the tools, as John said. Like, it's great to look into the toolbox. As John said, come into Galway, the quality of players that they had and the quality of players they could bring in, like Michael Donlan uh, and Paddy Joyce, who were never even involved in that ni in 97 team, to have them to come in. We didn't have that in the early 90s, but and neither did Mickey Ned or Ogie Moore. But when Paddy came in, he did. He had the toolbox, he had the quality of players because for three or four years Kerry had won to their 21s, there was a conveyor belt coming and by 97, 96 it didn't work really, we got our holes opened by Mayo in the semi-final and there's no doubt in that, we went up with our heads up our backsides, we went up, we actually were like Liverpool back in the FA Cup against United, we had suits on going into Crow Park, it was actually embarrassing to think of it and uh, we didn't wear the suits on the way out, I can assure you. <laughs> were the and, cream as well, no nice uh, cream we suits? We didn't go that far, no, we didn't go that far but... I say the suits were left in Crow Park anyway, but uh, within two weeks, Paddy had us back training. He had us back training in Banner Beach, and there was no turning back. We absolutely, he absolutely murdered us for those four or five months, and it continues. And, and thankfully, we did bounce back well. But then, the dead wood was going. There was guys on the panel in '96 that still weren't good enough. They were on the team that weren't good enough to win in All Ireland. Paddy got rid of that. He was bringing in guys from the 21, the likes of William Kirby, Derek Kaneda, uh, John Crowley, um, uh, Dennis Dwyer. All these guys were coming in. They were they were really competitive. They made they made the team really strong. And thankfully, we we, we eventually made a breakthrough in '97. You mentioned there about having a having a few pints, and it's been a kind of common team. But Mark O'Shea tells a story about G being on a training week, Seamus, where. Uh, the pints ended up getting a bit sour. I think there was a bit of a row, and I think you ordered a load of taxis and ordered everybody to get out of the place. Does that uh, does that bring back any memories? Yeah, well, I, I, it was actually Jack O'Connor was the manager at the time, Michael, and um, you know Jack. Jack went on and wrote a book, and he actually we had a. It was the it was a, one of the trips where Dan Duna, who was just coming into the team, Dan was a great player. He's actually living in New York at the minute, and it was a very very good player. But unfortunately, the same night, Dan got his jaw broken by some some fella with a, a kung fu kick, and that kind of started the whole thing, as you would imagine. But this was inside in a, in a bar, like you know. But I think Shamey Scanlon started roaring out, this is our island out in Lanzarote, and I think that didn't help much either, no, to be fair. But uh, all of a sudden, there were, we were well outnumbered, but thankfully, the taxi rank was around 20 yards. <laughs> we made a big dash to that, and, and off we went. But look, to be fair, look, most of the trips, and, and I would say 99.9% .9 of the trips that I went on, we had great time, we, 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 it was great bonding, and there was never any hassle. I, I would say that was the one only time that there was a, an opportunity where guys would have got hurt and whatnot, and no one wants that. Unfortunately for Dan, Dan came out the wrong side of it. He had to go home, and funny enough, I, I can still, my, my dad has passed away since, but yeah, we had a meeting that, that evening, and uh, Jack said, under no circumstances will anyone mention that Dan got his jaw broken like and and to, to this day I went home and said my to that oh, got bro his jaw broken in the training field and left it at that and the next second Jack came out with a book and fucking told everyone so <laughs> there was no point my mother came afterwards and said yeah, you know, and dad was there but she said I mean what's the story here why didn't you tell the truth like but look that's that's the way it is but that was around 10 years down the road after that like you know but uh, yeah some crazy trips but I think the boys have been on good trips we've all been on good trips and you know more, more often than not 
what goes on tour stays on tour. Oh, we'll ask the boys about that in a second. But Seamus, you mentioned Paddy O'Shea there, and you know what a legend, and you know so sad that we lost him so soon. But do you have a, fav a favorite Paddy O'Shea story that you might be able to tell us? Yeah, I well like. Paddy uh, was, was, you know, number one, was a fantastic manager. I don't think he got as much credit as he deserved. And, uh, but he, he was a great tinker of the game. Probably Paddy's biggest weakness was he was from an age where in the 70s, you, you played the All-Ireland in the 70s, or in, in September, and from October, November, December, and January, you just went away and did your own thing. You got your team holiday and you came back in January and you probably were a stone and a half overweight and you went back training again for four months, wouldn't look at liquor. The whole thing has changed. And even when we were coming to my end and back in, in even party time, it was changing and players' demands were more more needing and whatnot. But I suppose the, the, the most famous story with party was the time of the, the effing animals and, the, and the, the Arctic he did back in 2002 after we losing to Arma. And I, and I kind of felt sorry for party because he was on his own. He was, he, a, a guy came down, did an article, should have allowed him proofread it afterwards, but he didn't. And I think it just came out badly by party and, uh, and it went to papers and he got an awful going. We were actually in South Africa at the time. Uh, but I'd say Paddy wasn't planning to go, but he, he, he jumped on the plane fairly lively, I'd say, with all the hats that he was getting. But we met him out in um, Johannesburg, and he was, he was in good fettle now over inside. And at that, actually, at the same time, you had Kilkenny hurlers, and you had the Dublin senior footballers team staying in, I think it was the Cahillan Hotel, it was called, or something like that. Cullinan, yes. And uh, so it was just organised chaos there. No, great fun, and the whole lot. But I can remember. Um, Andy Comerford and Charlie Carter were just after coming in from the flight in and they were just came straight into the swimming pool. Lovely, lovely hotel. And they were having a fag and a couple of beers and they were just asking where the good spots to go and what's the crack down in Cape Town and what that. And all of a sudden, Paddy came in up, the, up from the foyer, up kind of these marble steps. He had the old Kerry Golden Years togs on and the runners, white socks. He had a t-shirt and he took off the t-shirt and he just jumped straight into the swimming pool and it was just swimming away and the boys were just after landing and they were looking at party swimming all the way up and touched touched the top swimming away back up again and charlie carter turned around to andy cover and said jesus this is some spot <laughs> <laughs> but uh but party you could write party did write a book uh, but he didn't write the proper book like he could have he could have really gone to town but look to be fair to him um it's a pity that he died back 10 years ago it's he's a big glass of GA and uh you know look he's uh it's a pity he's not coming up next sundays we're actually we're being rolled out next uh, next sunday 97 so it's a pity he's not part of it but look that's the joys of it uh, we're, you know but look that's the that's such is life just on that, was, was he wrong about the, the animals comment? Your, your supporters are particularly hard on, on your players when you're, when you're not maybe going well. I, I, no, he's not really. I, I just think he came out badly. But I think Kerry supporters are very, very critical. They expect a lot. And when you don't perform or if things go wrong, they will, be, they will micro uh, manage everything and they, they will be very critical. And I think that's the nature of the beast. Uh, I think it's no different to wearing a Manchester United jersey or a Liverpool jersey if you're up at that level and if you want to, if you want to perform at the base of it all the time, there's an expectation to perform and, and to perform well. If you don't do that, albeit as a player or as a manager or anyone part of the team, there's questions asked, simple as, and, and especially, as was, I, I think Paddy, it just came out badly by him and he didn't mean, he didn't mean it, but look, that's just, that's just the way it is. But yeah, Kerry supporters are very, very tough. Uh, but you know that's that's we just have to get on with that. Uh, John, would you be happy that you've done most of your inter-county management without the uh, online abuse potentially in social media and that? Like it's it's probably a headache that like it's a big headache for players and managers now. I was down. Jack O'Connor was saying it last week that you know no manager or player deserves to be abused by anybody. It is a it's a it's not a particularly nice part of the game, should we say now? No, I mean, look, at there's so many extra things in management now that wasn't there in, in, in my time, and social media is one of them, because, you know, the idea of keeping everything in camp and all of that stuff, players who mightn't, you know, be picked on a particular day if they put out a tweet, it's, you know, you fellas love to get a hold of it and, and uh, the next day, and that's, that's part of it and so on. But, like, I'd have to say, as, 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 a, as a former manager now at inter-county level, I'd hate to be starting out as a young manager now, in, in, in many senses, because there's so much involved. And, and sometimes, like it was very innocent back in the day in some, in, some, in some ways, 
and it's great that there's more organization and more science and so on put behind it but sometimes you wonder is it t like we we trained on tuesdays thursdays the, their gym programs are more or less done on their own, you know, in the various gyms around the county. Uh, and Saturday morning, and if you had a game on the Sunday, and oh, that was it. Like, but now they only they have maybe one rest day in the week, and their whole lives are controlled by it. So, intercounty careers are probably shorter now than they were back in the day. You know. I think we'll bring up Liam Currents for a few minutes. You might do a musical chairs with Seamus there, the old switcheroo. Great to have the former Leash, Tipperary and Limerick manager here. Uh, has social media been an issue for you in, in more recent years when you were over Tipperary, for example? Ah, yeah. Social media is huge now. and um, your, your singing was uh, shared on social yeah, media after that's a right, Yeah, Yeah, that was, I was, we, we played the... Um, Kevin, I don't want to bring this up now, but we played the quarterfinal against, um, I think it was Galway there back a couple of years ago. you the last but, half an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we went. We, we 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 played Mayo afterwards, and we got beaten by Mayo in the All Ireland semi final. And um, we went to a pub, as you do after the season was over. And um, yeah, we had a bit of a sing song there, and um, I sang a song after at some stage during it. And uh, we went out. Then we were going to someplace else, and I remember I went to to get a hole in the wall to get some money. And um, this couple of people came up alongside me. And they said, "Geez, we saw you on social media. You've gone viral." <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> I only just have to come out of the pub. So that's what they told me anyway. I had gone viral. I didn't even understand myself. What, what were you singing, actually? Um, it was a Dublin version of Johnny Jump Up. <laughs> Lee, Lee, of all the ma uh, players that you've managed over the years, you must have come across some unusual characters and some funny situations. Is there anything that comes to mind? Yeah, well, um, there was one that he, we was in Arlo, and they're a hard crowd to handle, um, the crowd in Arlo, if you know them in Tipperary, but um, anyway, um, one particular guy, he's Kieran McDonald, he played for me, he'd be one of the best cornerbacks I ever had, but his brother was on the team, and he was a little bit eccentric, we'll just say, and um, anyway, he was late for the match, we were playing a county semi-final, and out came, and we were at the top end, warming up, and the opposition were at the other side, and the ball... Chris anyway headed straight down to the other side and started kicking around with the opposition <laughs> and we had to tell him to, to come on up, he had to be called, he had actually taken a couple of kicks and he started realising, hold on a minute I don't recognise any of these guys but we called him anyway and he came on up and the irony of it is that um, he's an airline pilot now, he, he's, he, he flies plane for a living but I can tell you this, if I'm on any plane and his name is mentioned as a pilot, I'm getting off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a character, and actually, he's, I met him at a wedding only two months ago, and um, he was wearing a kilt. He's lived in Scotland for the last two or three years, and he's wearing a kilt now. <laughs> so that's the kind of character he is. <laughs> Kevin, what's it like managing players, and would you have had any situations, players doing funny things or trying to keep stories under wraps? Is, it, is, is there a lot more going on than we'd ever hear about? Uh, there, there would be. Um, you'll obviously have, um, you know, People learn about the drinking ban and they learn about maybe setting standards in the rest of them, which, which there is. And in fairness, most of the successful teams are almost set standards for themselves. You know, it's kind of the, the, the bigger guys that step in and the standards will drive higher. But you're always going to have fellas that might step out of line, <clears throat> you know what I mean? And sometimes you'd wonder afterwards whether they're really out of line or not because they're just human beings. But at the same time, you, you have a balance to find that you're holding the standards for the whole team so that you're keeping it up. But like definitely, like when I was in Sligo, there was two or three fellas there. Like they were just, you know, when they got the free rein, they got the free rein. And, and, and but like again, you know, it was, a, it was a case of once or twice having to genuinely drop one of your, one of your best players who was going playing well. But that was to hold to hold your dressing room because that was you were gone otherwise. But I do remember, but probably wouldn't happen now. But there was Stephen Cohn, there was you know Kenny Sweeney, and like that. But Stephen Cohn was probably our best player uh, in New York. And he was, um, we were coming to play Galway actually, in Galway. We actually beat Galway the first time ever in Galway at the time. But we had to put out at the time that he, he had pulled a hamstring because in fairness, he just, he did step out of line from where the standards were. But uh, he, he was a young fella, you know, you didn't want to be putting him out to, to hang him out to dry. But we eventually said that he pulled a hamstring, providing he was willing to step in behind and, and, and do the stats in the day. I was stuck for a filling stats, so he done the stats. But, but the point is, Back to John's point, the, the social media, you could hide that slightly back then, which is not too long ago, but now, 
that poor man will be hung drawn and quartered. So, but there is look at just times you have to protect your players, but it's, but it's a balancing act between whether they, I suppose, follow the protocol that the players set for them. Is there anything good, John, that you were able to hide that you could maybe reveal now? Um, I'm just thinking, Kevin, you weren't like none of your players were doing like the Ross Common boys playing pool half naked or anything in three or four in the morning or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, and, and not one of them had a pool stick. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any any stories, John, that you can reveal? Um, maybe that happened back in the day. Maybe that 25 years later, it's okay for them to I, see the light I, of day. I've always said that if you lose a game, there was chairs flying in the dressing room at half time, and if you win a game, there's inspirational speeches. You know, so. No, in fairness, uh, uh, there would be there would be some stories. I there's definitely a wry smile on your face there. I, t I think there's yeah. something deep down in the locker uh, there. Yeah. Well, you 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 pick your battles. You can win as well, but you have to be like to be honest. Uh, the reality is, if if you have a panel of thirty and twenty eight of them are putting in a massive effort, they want to know that the guys beside them are doing it as well. So uh, if you don't if you don't act on certain things. You know, they'll say, well, he can get away with that, why, why can't I, you know, or whatever. But I think in the, modern, in the modern game, like, I was really impressed by the Limerick players at the weekend. To hear them talking, every single one of them was talking about the group and the family and using those words. And like the superstars in that, in that team, but they were all deflecting it to the group. And it, it, it's not surprising that they've won whatever four out of the last five All Irelands, and 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 that was with these lads too, back in the day. Like you, you and, and and all the the, the Kerry t the great Kerry teams, the, the special char characteristics associated with winning, and f five or six good, we'll say leaders within a, a dressing room can lift it, or five or six can pull it the other way. And we were in that crisis in 2001 when it was common beasts in the Connacht semi-final, and we, we took a week off from training, and I knew the players had to go out to their workmates and saying, yeah, you were shite yesterday, and you know, you, you, deserve, you know, and what is a man he asked, and all that stuff. They had to go through all that and, and come back the following Tuesday week. And if we hadn't leaders in that dressing room, I knew after 15 minutes of that training session that things that we were on the way back, and, and I, I remember, if, I don't know whether Kevin remembers it or not, but we, I said, I, I told whoever was ref in the game, call it off, we we'll wouldn't have a meeting, and we chatted for a few minutes, and we left the dressing room, because the reality was that if, if that wasn't, if that situation wasn't rescued, when I say we, the management left the dressing room, if everyone was a loser, whereas if it was rescued, everyone was a winner, and that's, it ended up, three months later where we were wouldn't they all earn by nine points you know Kevin can I bring you back to 1998 and the documentary year till Sunday it's something we talked to John about a, a while back as a player and I suppose you were you weren't just green you weren't fresh off the uh, you know in at that stage what did you make of the documentary behind the scenes happening during the middle of this season it's something that I wouldn't be overly comfortable with myself um, if you organize someone to come in but to be fair, Pat Comer was there for three years and this was going on all the time. That was his, his profession. So there was, there was absolutely nothing there. I suppose that's why he was so good because everybody, I suppose, just saw him doing his job as in clips for himself or whatever it was. There was never a mention of a documentary. There was never a mention of... It was just like he was coming in with his gear bag. Is that right? it was, it was, there, was, there was trust there that you wouldn't... I mean, if I, I wouldn't allow any yeah. outside journalist or whatever to come in to do it. But he was our sub goalie luck, like. and he had. I think he had started. He actually intended to do it the year before with Mayo when he was going to, after the won the semi final in '97, uh, a month till Sunday. In other words, just do the lead up, and obviously John Mahan didn't feel like letting him in, and I can see why. But it was different in our cases, and and in our case as well, it might never have seen the light of day if we hadn't won, you know. But so to say you're lucky you won it because you you never heard the end of it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, that, that was, you, you, that's true, that's true, there was, and, and he was so goalie on the day, he had a camera in the dugout, so he was getting all the close-ups, and if Martin McNamara got injured, he, he, he was throwing the camera, someone said he might bring the camera into the goals then, or whatever, you know, but, <laughs> but I know if that happened, then it would be, as Mick McCarthy used to say, it would be squeaky bum time for me, you know. <laughs> but to be fair as well to Pat, I think, he even talking to John Dively and Michael Donnell, it was almost like 
he was having a game with himself with the camera. That wasn't set up for a documentary later on that I was aware of. And that's why he probably came across so natural because the boys were talking to him as if they were doing him a favor for his own job. And I think the whole lot came together. Yeah, yeah. It was, just, very, it, just, look, we were, it was very natural. And as the camera was there during the year, we just got, we got lost consciousness that it was there. And I suppose that was the, the secret of it. In other words, there was no one performing in front of the camera, you know. And we had, the, one of them was a team meeting, I think after it was common drew it, is where there was fairly harsh things said. But again, when the storyline at the end is good, you know, everyone wants to see it then, you know. Absolutely, it was brilliant stuff, it really was. All three of you have managed against your native counties at different stages. Liam, can I ask you about it? Because you've done it with both Limerick and, uh, you, I'm not sure, did you do it with Leash as well? You certainly did it with yeah, Tipperary as yeah, well. Yeah. What's it like? Was it ever a problem for you or did you just see it as, this is a, you know, a project, this is a, I just need to get this done, it's a job? Yeah, well, I, I got involved with um, Sigerson and um, Third Level and uh, I, I showing my age now, but I coached Kevin Walsh back then as well. So um, that's where I started, and then it just went from there. I ended up going into, um, first of all, into club in Limerick, and then I took over the Limerick football team, and I would have played against John O's Galway team back then. And um, you end up then being asked to do another job and so on. Um, but Kerry had no interest in me, so um, I ended up then going to... I, I packed it in actually for a while because, as John said, it was getting to the stage where it was 24-7 and you either had to do it full-time or you didn't do it at all. And uh, certainly if you want to do it properly, you had to go at it full-time. And um, I left it off. Um, I finished a, a, a degree in, in physical conditioning and fitness and then I went back in again. I went to Roscommon for a year as a coach and then I went back into Tipperary for four years. And um, I did it, as I said, I'd, I'd retired from my job and I was able to do it full-time. And it's my honest opinion that anybody that, that's doing it now needs to be at it full-time. You've got 20, 30 backroom team, you need all of those. Um, it's just, as Jono said, it's probably gone too serious now. It's probably gone to the stage where how far more can it go? You know, are we going to have to pull this back? Is it an amateur sport or isn't it? Um, and certainly I don't think the players can give any more than they're giving now. So, but again, at management level, it's the same thing. Um, it's a black hole. You can put as many hours in as you want and you still wonder, have you put in enough? And um, so I agree with John. You know, John says the same thing. It, when I was playing against John with Limerick, um, it was a totally different preparation scene to what it is now, and it's really changed completely. So um, yeah, it's it's um, it's a complete change. And just on you asked me about social media, I think the players, the present day players, have to put up with social media, and it's it's ridiculous what they have to put up with in relation to social media. And I would say management the same, but the players in particular, and um, they never had to do that in our era, you know, and, um, and they were better for it. I, I think the social media is great um, in certain ways, like, as you say, singing a song or whatever, but when it's used to abuse people, I think it's wrong, you know. Yeah. Kevin, would you, um, w was it difficult to manage in against Galway when you were with Sligo? Is it something that bothered you at all? I suppose my situation was probably different to the, to the two guys because I had, I suppose, doing a job against some of the people I played with, so that might be a different kettle of fish. But I was very comfortable in my own skin heading to Sligo. Um, <clears throat> number one, I wanted to learn, learn. And number two, I felt that, well, Sligo were in Division 4, Galway were in Division 1, and I wasn't a threat to my own county. And I always felt if I did become a threat over that period, I must be doing a good job, so I'd be quite happy to take that. So I wasn't coming in and saying, well, this is this is taking Galway out, you know. So we did eventually have a lot of success against my own county, but you know I have to say that I suppose the job I was I was there to a job, and the amount of work we had put in driving up and down to Sligo for so many years, you still you you kind of create family with the group you're with. So I mean that was my one goal was to win every game I could, and uh, I was very clear going in that day if I if I could beat Galway I had to beat Galway. That was it. That was my job and. I ordered the guys up and all the work in for me. Um, did I think at this, that we'd come to that level starting off at Sligo? Probably not because of where we come from, but, but it did. Okay, well, uh, we've uh, delighted to be joined by a host of famous faces here tonight. So uh, we're just going to start off with uh, Pat Spillane. And I suppose, Pat, first of all, sorry to hear that you're leaving the Sunday game. Look, first of all, the one thing I'd like to say here tonight is this general knowledge quiz question. Hands up here who has eight All-Irelands, nine All-Stars and was played here twice. 
I'll give you a clue. He's up here on the stage, and there's none of these guys here beside me. But look what the one thing I say is, Galway football, listen, great achievement to get to an All-Ireland final. And look at guys, there's no shame in losing to the great Kerry five in a row team to be. That's all I'd say. Well done. And uh, Bri Brian Cody, your thoughts after last Sunday's incredible game? I wish her as nice it was. Uh, overall, you know, hugely proud of the players. You know, I thought they showed great, you know, carried themselves so well. Great sportsmanship, great dignity, great ambassadors for the game, which is more than I can say for myself this year, the way I carried on. <laughs> <laughs> Colin O'Rourke, uh, you're not happy that Sean Hurston is ref in the game on Sunday? Well, look, at, I think the one reason I wanted David Goff to get the refereeing job this year is that it's probably the only chance you'll have of a meat man being on the pitch on the All-Ireland final day for about 40 years. <laughs> uh, Don Lowe Cusick, you were pretty passionate Sunday night on the telly. Uh, look, all I'm going to say, as a cockman looking ahead to Galway, Kerry, I'm going to say this. I hope they both lose. <laughs> uh, Colm Gooch Cooper, how do you see the game going on Sunday? Uh, look at for me, I think uh, I think it's going to come down to David Clifford at the end of the day. Uh, I think if Clifford plays, I think Kerry will win by 11 or 12 points. And I think if Galway can hold him, uh, I think it'll be a lot closer. I think Kerry will win by just 9 or 10 points. <laughs> Uh, Des, uh, Des Cahill, you have an announcement for us uh, tonight. It's competition time here in the Sunday game and text your name and number to 51551 to be in with a chance of winning a fantastic first prize of two tickets to win the audience for Up for the Match on Saturday night and a second prize of four tickets to be on Up for the Match Sunday night. <laughs> <laughs> James Horan, uh, you, are you looking forward to Sunday? Um, look, if Galway win, uh, I have a one-way ticket booked to Argentina Sunday, so I am getting the fuck out of there. <laughs> Leo Varadkar, delighted you could uh, join us tonight, Tarnished. Uh, first of all, I would just like to say, um, I think both sides um, will very much look forward to competing for the Pro 14 trophy on Sunday. Uh, hashtag, I absolutely haven't got a clue. <laughs> Uh, John Mahan, some spare time in your hands now, John. Yes, thanks very much, Shane. Listen, it's absolutely fantastic to be here tonight. And uh, what can I say? I'm back on the market, guys. Let's just say I might not be the youngest manager out there. I might not be the tactically most innovative manager out there. But by God, for my age, I'm still the best looking. <laughs> <laughs> Ursula Jacob, what has stood out for you so far tonight? Look, you know, for me, I think that Galway, if they are to have a chance on Sunday, I think Keane O'Neill and Porrick Joyce, they definitely will tell the Galway players to push up on the Kerry puck out on Sunday. Boris Johnson, former UK Prime Minister, welcome to Galway. Look, I believe that uh, Galway will emerge victorious. So the one thing I would say is Kerry have as much chance as there is of me uh, telling the truth. Good day. <laughs> uh, Pat McDonough, Mr. Supermax himself. Hello, Pat McDonough here. And just to say, the Galway team reminds me of the Supermax uh, chicken breast sandwich because it's only made from the finest locally sourced ingredients. Uh, always fresh, never frozen. And I'll tell you a bit like Shane Welch when he gets the ball. When it's gone, it's definitely gone. <laughs> <laughs> Eamon Fitzmaurice, former ma uh, Kerry manager, call it. Uh, well, to be honest, uh, I think if Kerry can get the ball into the inside line quicker than I can get to the end of a sentence, I think they have a huge chance. Mihalo Murakarti, Falcha. Now the first thing I would say is Tolon Dineon Shah. That means there's a lot of people here, but I think there'll be very little in it on Sunday. And I think what it could come down to is something very small. And the key could be this. Whichever side can outscore the opposition by even a point or two at the final whistle, I think they'd have a great chance. <laughs> and finally, Park Joyce, a uh, final word from you. How will Sunday go, PJ? Oh, yeah, look at the fucking, look up fucking Sunday. We're fucking better side of the fucking... <laughs> Brilliant stuff from Aidan Tierney. Thanks very much, Aidan. Appreciate it. Thank you very it. much. Uh,
Okay, so that's it for part one of the show. We'll be back in part two, previewing the game, analysing it with Seamus, Liam, John, Kevin, myself and Michael. And we'll chat to you again so in a few minutes. Here's a couple of videos in the meantime. Martin Daly's famous back heel point against Tipperary in the Munster Football Championship for Clare in 2000. He got the ball, back flick over the bar from seven yards out. Absolute magic. Five attempts each. Oh, the pressure's on. He's left footed and he's going with his right. Yes, there's one. What are we doing? I've got two balls. Oh, good save. Last one, you might need to send it. Good softballs here. Ah. Ah. Right, Nisha, you're up. You're too far out. <laughs> oh, it's over! <laughs> yeah, yeah, it didn't look great, but it got over. Come back in, Letcher. Ah, Jesus. Oh, I helped him out. Actually, <laughs> 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 he's he somehow got it in style going there. He knows what he's doing. How did he get 4 out of 5? Pressure's on in a big way. Bring it into me. Oh, <laughs> one for one. <laughs> <laughs> making genuine attempts to save it too. <laughs> you see, one more. I feel like I'm being done here by. <laughs> ah, there we go. Then they come on in and we take our bait. Like Jimmy Barry Murphy, I can do it all. <laughs> Four out of five by 80% is not bad. Two for me. I think two for me. And uh, what you get? One. Yeah. <laughs> On top. We're talking about the value of catching a high ball and how to do it. Eddie, what do you think is the is the key thing when you're looking to catch a high ball and make sure you're good in the air? Um, there's probably a lot of things, but I suppose being tall is one of them. It'd be, it's, it's, it's an impact factor, but it's probably not the be all and end all either. I think, you know, I've seen Richie Hogan, I let him pluck mm. high balls and, you know, so not a bother on him. Um, it's body position, it's probably how quickly you can assess the situation, judging the flight of the ball. There's a lot of things, um, and at the end, it's what you're trying to do. So for me, uh, ideally, you like to be on a defender's left hand side because for me, my strength was going to be, you know, coming in, be it from the blind side, or if you could set. So often and often there was a duel, it was jockeying for position. And if you got to set yourself and got the arm early, you were now in a position of strength to catch the ball. Whereas, you know, ideally then if you take, going up against JJ Delaney, his hurdle is in this hand. So you're, you're in his, He's trying you're to in his world now. So, um, and that's not a nice place to be because he gets the ball. But um, yeah, there, there are things you would think of. It depends what you're also trying to do. You know, are you trying to get a clean catch or are you trying to get it to ground? So I would have, I think defenders like, they like you in their vision, whether it's the peripheral vision, the corner, the right, they needed to be able to mind you. So that's all, once they had you, then it was dependent. For them, I think they have the luxury of being able to say, look, once we get it to ground or we don't allow in primary possession, we'll, we'll deal with that. Um, sometimes, it depended on the circumstances. If you had two or three lads there and you felt I can take it off them, you would maybe go back out behind. If there's two or three lads there, get off the ground and get your hurl to the ball, get it to the ground, and then you're gone. So mm. if they're if they're waiting, um, the last thing I would say is important is probably the trajectory that the ball is coming at. If it's a flyer that's low, then it's different. You probably need to get a hurl to it. If it's the one that's hanging in the air. You know, is it going to just plonk straight down? Is there carry on it? You know, you'd be saying, can we break it through? Or if I get a hurdle across in front of the goalie, is it going to fly all the way to the net? So there's a lot of things to consider. But um, for me, it was probably getting the defender here and ideally coming in where he can't see you. Yeah. If, I, if I'm a wing back, um, let's, say I'm playing, let's say I'm playing left wing back. So the sideline is there and the ball is coming across to you that way. 
I'm under pressure straight away because trying to get my arm across you to catch the ball, you're going to be able to interfere with my arm some way and stop me. So I will be looking to just break that yeah. down in front of you. But if I'm at the other side and the sideline's over there, as a defender, which I normally am, I'd be looking to get up and use the fact that in this situation I'm a little bit taller than you and I'd try and almost plant you down like that and use your own body weight against yeah. you and try and get across for the ball. So what would you do about that? It's probably momentum is allowing you that. That's you, once you get into, you're jockeying for a position. So once you get the dominant position then or get the, the jump on somebody, um, I don't know after that, I used to struggle with that because I, I was no good at pulling on the ball. Um, and he always got caught for freeze if I did that. But it's hard to do that then because, you know, he has the advantage on you every way. And once someone pushes you away, so it's, can you get up and get a hurl back up? Or do you just try, just even stunt the ball some mm. way? Or, but I think usually once a defender gets the jump on you like that, that is the game of cat and mouse that develops underneath the ball. And if they get it, you're gone. So that's where the, the trick was. Alternatively then, you just try to keep on the move. So your footwork was important to get out and then start your run in. But uh, generally for me, in that scenario that you just described, the slides out, I think mm. whoever gets into that dominant position, it's, it, they have it. And close to goal then, I'll just put myself as the full forward for a second. If the ball is coming in high, I'm nearly going to want to just get you like that. So I can sort of catch and, and almost be ready to spin straight away. Is that something you would have done? Yeah, and again, it depends what you're going to do. Are you going to get off the ground? Because, you know, you know I found somebody in Germark and whoever, Jay's are very good, but similar heights. So you had to try to get off the ground or maybe Dunnick or Cody or someone like that. So it depended if you got the stance on him. You yeah. know, if you could, you're judging where it is. And just before both you to stand strong underneath, if you can get that much, now you're in a position of dominance. Alternatively then for a back, I suppose, they have the luxury of just being able to do, they can just shove you or just balk you. The ball is on the ground now, it's, it's a 50-50. But there is an element to that, and, and again, some lads, like, you know, going in trying to compete high with Lowen or Dermot O'Sullivan, you know, you weren't going to move them underneath that ball. So you had to think differently. It was maybe get around blindsided, come in on top. Sometimes that's all you wanted was get it to ground and maybe something after that. But uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of components again to that that make it such a, a technical thing. But it's, it's also thinking and then maybe practicing that a good bit because it was an area that I was shocking poor at. But around 06, 07, it was an area that I, I really targeted and it did improve a little bit. Like, but it just gives you something more. Whereas other than that, I was just being bullied under high ball all the time.
Welcome back to On Pukon here in Galway, brought to you by Heineken. We're with, um, we're with Seamus Moynihan, Kevin Walsh, who are wrapped in conversation at the moment. Myself, Shane Stables, and Michael Verney, which is always here. Seamus, we're getting into the, the match preview now, Galway against Kerry this Sunday. And Michael actually was just saying there during the interval, how on earth would you mark David Clifford? How would you mark David Clifford if you were still playing? Yeah, that, uh, good question. Um, t to be fair, David on his day is uh, he's a handful, and and basically um, for the first 35 minutes against Dublin, he was virtually unmarkable. To be fair, um, um, I thought Dublin were a little bit naive. I thought uh, Dublin didn't get protection back on the full back line. Uh, it, it reminded me back when we played in the days back in 2001. Um, I can remember we were marking, we were playing Mead in the semi-final. He went on to beat him afterwards, but myself and Mike McCarthy were in the full back line. There was two, two v two. We could look seventy yards right, left, and it was just so much space there and an absolute nightmare of a place to play as a full back or a corner back. Um, Dublin last weekend, it, they were getting bodies back, but they were very, very slow. And, and they, to be fair, they gave Fitzsimons no protection whatsoever. And like David had his hands up all day long, just looking for ball. And even if Stephen O'Brien kicked the last ball in just before half time, and he just put a little bit of height and linked into it, it was another goal. Did it because it, it, he'd have got it, Clifford would have got it. He was in that kind of form. Uh, how would you mark David? Number one, you need help. Certainly, and I think the way Galway are setting up themselves up, they've been doing that and they've been doing it very well all year. Um, as a man, if I was saying the, the night before the game, if I was going marking David Clifford, I'd only have eyes for David Clifford and absolutely nothing else. I think you can't visualise anything else, only marking David Clifford, touch tight and not really giving a damn about anything else. And if you're, if you're a millimetre away from him, you're too far away because he's a kind of a fella that he gets it, he can shell left and right, he cannot get that space. And if he gets that space, he's going he's gonna to punish you absolutely every time, nine times out of ten. So if I was the cornerback, if I was Liam Selk, if I was McHugh on the other side, I'd be saying, or whoever's going to pick him up, if it's Sean Kelly, uh, who did a very well, good job, to be fair to the men in the, in the Secrets of Final this year, albeit in bad conditions and a different competition, and it's not crop art, but you have to just be insanely tight eyes on him all day and basically follow him into the bathroom until the game is over and it's that's that's how it, it, you just cannot do anything else and you cannot look for ball you cannot do anything you just have to be on him all day not running up the field not doing anything and on top of that you need protection as well because if you don't get protection from from the outside line which they will Galway are setting that up and Galway I suppose Kevin brought that in in his time I think Project came in initially and wanted to play a more traditional football game of Galway. And, you know, unfortunately that day is gone and uh, you can bring a bit of into it. But if you're not protecting your full back line and your backs, you're gone. But to be fair, Galway are very defensive and they will be far more defensive than Dublin were the last day. So I think Kerry will struggle with that. We have struggled against defensive teams in the past. And, and those players, the, the, the wing forwards, the midfielders coming back, helping um, the back line and helping the guys marking the likes of David and Shawnee, that will certainly make it a much hard, harder task for those boys. In 2018, Kevin, you managed the Galway team that beat Kerry in the championship for the first time since I think it was the 60s. So it was, it was a huge gap. How focused were you on like a single player going into that game? Could, can you afford to be focused on a single player when you're manager of a team like Galway? Uh, look, you have to know the, the strengths and attack the strengths, but at the same time, you need the system around that. And I think James has mentioned the word help a number of occasions. It's, it's gone that way. You just have to, I mean, the type of ball is given, crossfield balls. You know, people know they're a lot quicker how to move left, move right. Back in our day, it was kind of the two corner forwards ran out in straight lines out towards their own wing, and they were told not to cross the full forward. And now it's just moving everywhere. And there's also only two left inside mostly now. So, but your zone defence has to be well set up. That you know, you may even have to pass them on to the next marker. That's the way it's gone. You know, because it, it, Clifford, Clifford can kick on his second step. If you watch him, he's you know where most players will take four. So he will, like he's that, he's that quick. And if you're not close, like, like James has said, he will shoot. And he's very, 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 very accurate with, with both feet. So, uh, because you can have man markers, but you have to have the help defense around. But at the same time, it's to find the balance. How do you get out of there if, when you turn the ball over? And, you know, maybe looking at Galway against Derry, that outlet wasn't there. It was, for the first half, it was 15 behind this, the halfway line. Uh, but I suppose what we probably wanted to do was not to concede too early and stay in the game to make sure they were there. Uh, I, pres I presume they'll do the same against Kerry at the weekend. I do expect a very, very defensive from Galway, uh, just to shut out the likes of 
Sean O'Shea and, and Clifford and play themselves into the game and uh, see where it goes from there. Uh, Kevin, you talked talk to us before about bringing a player into the ugly zone. Uh, can you just explain what that is and how will Galway go about trying to get the likes of Clifford and Sean O'Shea out of their comfort zone completely and into that ugly zone that you call it? Look, the ugly zone is just and it's another phrase, I suppose, for the, for the out of the comfort zone because sometimes if we keep talking the same language, people don't listen. So if you just put a different phrase like taking somebody into the ugly zone, what you're doing is taking them to somewhere they don't want to be. So you take David Clifford on Sunday. What does he want? He wants space. He wants to get the two steps we speak about. He wants the early ball with no protection around, around him. So obviously, how do you take him in the ugly zone? You don't give him space. You bring help defense beside him. Uh, you're all over him like Seamus says, you're not a millimeter away. And also you put pressure on the kicker outside not to give the handy bounce pass inside and make the ball be poor coming in. So now you have somebody in the ugly zone that they don't actually like. Uh, and, you know, at that time, I suppose frustration will kick in at times. So maybe look at Shane Walsh being marked, we'd say the man markers for Armagh, which was aggressively man marking. Shane likes to get space as well. And I suppose he's been pulled and dragged all over the place. And look, that's another day for talking about referees and linesmen. I mean, that's crazy what goes on. With two, with two linesmen sitting there with the, with the flag in their hands, uh, supposed to be top-class referees. They see what's going on and they don't intervene. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. If you want to protect your best players, uh, it's madness. You know? So I'd love to see the day where the linesmen have a whistle themselves, not looking up at the, at, the, at the referee. And if something happens, blow the whistle. Blow the whistle, bring the ball back, book them, and, and, and get a 14-yard free. What's wrong with that? Clean the game up and give extra responsibility to referees. I think this. Too much going on with referees where it's my week this week, don't, don't move in, you'll have your day out next week. You know, that attitude has got to go and give proper accountability to referees to protect the likes of, of the, the best players. Seamus, is there any concern from a Kerry point of view that, you know, you waltz through Munster, as is often the case, you play against a, a Mayo team that's down, arguably it's two best forwards in uh, Ryan O'Donoghue and Tommy Conroy, obviously they're, they're out for a good while there. And then you face a Dublin team that are without arguably the best forward in the country, Con O'Callaghan. So maybe Kerry have gone in beating Mayo and Dublin, but not the best versions of those teams. Yeah, 100%, good point. And uh, like, take Munster at the minute. Munster is, is, is a very weak province at the minute. Uh, Corker are well, well down off the, off the step where they should be, considering the amount of underage talent that they're producing, and it's just not going up into the senior level. Limerick for the Munster final was an non event, and, uh, which is disappointing. So, Jane Wiley, I was going up to the Mayo game, and uh, I, I was concerned that day because we had gone four or five weeks without playing a championship match. Mayo had come through, uh, obviously missing a couple of players, but they had gone through a couple of hard games in the qualifiers. And uh, but we were, if if Mayo brought their scoring boots that day, we were in trouble. Especially five minutes into that second half, where they missed four or five very easy chances to go maybe four or five points up. And for the last 20 minutes, I think Kerry took control. So. To be fair, we were delighted to get over that game, and it was basically shit or burst against Dublin then. But it was about time we had to throw that monkey off the back once and for all. Um, the last time we had beaten Dublin was 2009. We gifted them one in 2011, and after that, they've been bullying us for the last number of years, and they have been the better team. So it was great to get that one over the line. And no doubt, Conor Callaghan, if we, had, if we didn't have David Clifford, it would have been a different game as well. Conor Cannon was a huge loss to Dublin. He was a focal point, and he certainly in the first half, he was a huge loss to them. To be fair to Dublin in the second half, Kieran Kil Kilkenny gave an exhibition of football. They all stepped up to the mark, and I think Kerry regressed in. Five point lead wasn't enough, and the minute Dublin got the goal, we were, we, it was definitely. It was, it was always going to be a 50-50 whether we are going to win the game or not. And it just took a super score from Sean Shea to get us over the line. So, look, we're in a final. <coughs> we probably haven't beaten the best Dublin team for the last number of years. It's probably the weakest Dublin team. But it was important that we mentally did that. And we're in an All-Ireland final playing a Galway team very similar to Kerry in the sense that they're all players, with the exception of three players in Kerry that have all our medals, every one of them are going for their first title. So this is going to be a very new day for every one of them. Uh, I would say Galway are far happier playing Kerry in the all Ireland final than Dublin. Playing Dublin in the Ireland final with uh, a packed hill, 60,000 possibly Dublin supporters, a confident team that have won all Ireland, have six or seven all Ireland's in their back pocket, that means an awful lot. This Kerry team doesn't have that swagger, unfortunately. 
but they will bring confidence. They are happy to be in an All Ireland final. But I, I, I totally take your point. I think our path to the final has been an easier one, with the exception of Dublin, the semi final, where it was always going to be a hard one mentally for the boys to get over the line, which they did. And I think that that is a big, major, big step for them. They have to come off that now and get ready for an All Ireland final against a really, really strong defensive Galway team with really good forwards as well. Sorry to put, uh, put you on the spot, Seamus. You mentioned Mayo. Are you aware locally in Mayo that your name is one of the names going around for the Mayo job? And is that something that interests you at all? Or does inter-county management interest you? I was actually chatting to a former Mayo player today and he said that to me. Yeah, I have no news to me, you know, Michael. I'm, I'm living down in Killarney uh, unless I buy a helicopter or uh, divorce my they wife. Might fly, they might fly and, uh, you up. Yeah, yeah, it's it's highly likely, you know, Michael. To be fair, no, I'm uh, happy where I am at the minute with with a couple of kids and training. My young fella Jamie came up with me there, so I'm doing that under 17 team, and I'm involved with East Kerry divisional team at the minute. So happy enough in that level, and maybe in time get involved with underage with Kerry as well or something like that. But you know, the boys alluded to earlier on into county management is absolutely insane. Um, I'm working in the private sector, and and Monday to Friday it's 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 high octane. And um, at the end of the day, to try and be a manager of any inter-county team, it's, it's, it's a full-time job. And I think the sooner maybe the GA grab that horns and make managers full-time rather than this hokey-pokey under the table thing, you know, I, I think it's time that managers are full-time going forward, you know, and maybe, maybe you have an opportunity then. But until then, four and a half hours up the road certainly doesn't appeal to me anyway, up and down. <laughs> you mentioned beating Dublin there. What does beating Dublin do? For, for this Kerry group, they've been waiting 11 years to beat Dublin in a championship game. What, like, what does it do for this Kerry group? I'd imagine they were walking in on high. As you said, the turnaround is a bit tricky, but I'd imagine it gives them a big confidence lift. And you could say maybe they fell over the line somewhat, but you're still getting over the line. You're still putting yourself in that position. Would there be, you know, will they be sticking the chest out a small bit more? Will there be a bit more confidence going into this final now maybe than before? A bit more belief even? Yeah, I think Jack, look, Jack's a very experienced manager, no different to all the boys that are here. And obviously the boys would be delighted and elated to have beaten Dublin in the manner, I suppose, it kind of makes up a little bit for the 2011 defeat when, when Stephen Cluxon put the ball over the bar and, and the referee didn't even give Kerry an opportunity to have a, have a, have a go to level the game, which was, I always felt was very harsh. So we've been waiting that length of time. And as I said earlier, I think Dublin have been the better team and have bullied us and their, pan, their subs coming in Every, every year, the Mac Menemans uh, coming in, getting goals. It was just a sucker punch. Their panel and the guys that were bringing in was, was absolutely brilliant. But they didn't have that last day. I think Dublin's panel uh, and subs, especially uh, Niall Scully was the only guy who, who, and Paddy Small came on. He didn't start. They, they certainly gave a little bit of an impetus, but their bench was not nearly as strong as it was in previous years. Uh, and yet we still only fell over the line. But it's still mentally, I think, is a very, very big one for, for Kerry. I think last year or a couple of years ago, in 2019 we had those opportunities and we didn't uh, and so I think they've got a little bit more grit mentally they're a bit sh they're certainly stronger and defensively they're a bit stronger as well I think their Petty Telly has certainly brought in a more defensive uh, operation in there in the sense that they're they're bringing bodies back they're tackling hard there was a lot of turnovers against Dublin and we, we spoke about it earlier on players like Gavin White who was giving away very very city freeze before in front of goals that's all stopped yeah. so they've definitely improved defensively Massive win for Dublin, but it's no different to me. Oh, beating Dublin last year it is absolutely sweet, fuck all good, unless you go on and win the All Ireland. We will come to Paddy Talley in a while because obviously Kevin knows him very well. But uh, an interesting one I saw this week is Matthew Tierney, who's centre forward for Galway. His mother hails from Castle Island and she went to school with David and Paddy Clifford's mother. So I thought that was an interesting one. Uh, but in terms of the, the penalty shootout against Armagh in the quarter final, I just, like it was very dramatic. It was the first time a championship game in football went to penalties at Croke Park. And I just wonder how big was this for them? And he said afterwards, and he hit the winning penalty himself, Matthew Tierney. He said, I remember I was playing soccer a long time ago. It was under 14 Kennedy Cup. We lost and it was a penalty shootout and I refused to take one. I was one of the better kickers on the team. Never again, you have to step up. And Kevin, I just wonder the manner of Galway, getting through that extra time, getting through, you know, the row that happened, I suppose, at full time, getting through the penalty shootout. What does that sort of an event, that sort of a day do for a team? It's massive because it's a mental test. I know Seamus has spoke about the mental test with Dublin and so Galway have had their mental test as well and I suppose 
a bit on their own doing as well because they were far the better team and lost a six point lead towards the end but, it, but they still had to dig it out and, and, and they've done that um, but that's something else to be looking at now is that I suppose they've had a slow start Galway have had slow starts and finishes and matches which you know they'll be a little bit worried on that as well because they've been late goals but which caused the penalties but you know what it's probably made them a stronger team the fact they got over the line by having to go to the wire with with with, uh, with uh, Armagh and even the row itself was it was it was another one and uh, it just you know has probably fastened them a little bit better for the for the row for the row ahead for the game ahead should I say um, so they should be in, in, in a better place for that and so, just to talk about Paddy Talley, you had him in 2018, which was the year that you beat Kerry. Are you looking at Kerry now, and do you see any of his hallmarks? Are Paddy Talley's fingerprints over this Kerry team, from what you can see? You can definitely, certainly see he's trying to get it back, uh, steady up, and it is steady up quite a bit. I still think there's a bit of work to be done. Um, I think the sweeper they're using at the minute, I think, which is mainly Morley at the minute, he's, which is a very honest worker, you can see by him, he's an honest player. I just feel the positioning of the sweeper isn't isn't where it needs to be at the minute. Um, it's there's kick passes over, or to the left or right, which are bounce passes to the likes of Comer. Uh, and again, the help defence from the sweeper, I don't think is as close as it should be to, to the threat. Should so, he be closer to the full back line? Well, depending on where the ball is, it's a, if you're more than one kick away, you should be marking space in front. And if you're less than a kick away, you should be beside, beside the, the double team. So. I just think there's a little bit of no man's land at the minute in, the, in that sweeper if the kicking is good enough inside and uh, I'm sure that's something they'll have looked at over the last while and but you can certainly see that there's they're looking at you know, the amount of goals that's going is, isn't that many and in fairness Costello's goal was a super super goal it was one of those one in a million shots to be honest it was, it was a superb shot albeit it came from a mishandle from from David Morden's handling so out the field but you know obviously they're stopping the goals going in which is a big a big, a big step up how important, Seamus, is that from a, a Kerry supporter's point of view? Conceded three goals in the All-Ireland semi-final to Tyrone last year. Have conceded three goals in 12 games, league and championship this year. While you have all the, you know, the great forwards and all the silky skills and can kick all the great scores, it must be hugely satisfying to look at a defence shutting out another team. A defence being pretty mean. Maybe, as Kevin says there, there's a bit of room for improvement. But that must be hugely satisfying that they're getting as much, much satisfaction out of a turnover as they are kicking a score. Yeah, Michael, look, I suppose last year Tyrone got three goals, but they could have got another three or four goals, like, to be fair. So we were very, very open. And, uh, you know, it's, it's you're, you're, you're getting scores on the far side. David Clifford's getting great points. Sean Shea, Paul Gainey is getting great points. But if, you're, if you have holes in the bucket on the far side, it's an absolute nightmare. And, you know, you talk to any managers or coaches, they always say defence wins win matches for you. If you're leaking in the back and you're, you're, you're constantly looking like you're going to concede a goal or give away a freeze, it's there's no point it's going to it just turns into a shootout in michael so to be fair to petty telly has come in it's work in progress he has done very well but they're still it's still not probably the, the way Kerry play football and uh, but they've certainly improved and i think they're they're free the, the amount of frees are giving away now versus last year has far reduced and on top of that i think they've conceded two goals in championship which which is far better than what they were doing the last few years. Every time we played Dublin over the last number of years, every time we played Tyrone, a team that counter-attacked fast and took us on, we looked awfully porous in defence. So that has changed. Unfortunately, the last day the goal Dublin got, it came, as, as Kevin said, David and Dara mixed up with a hand pass and within five seconds the ball was in the back of the net on the other side. Galway have that potential to do that as well, so we have to be re we have to be uh, ready for that. But genuinely, our defence has improved, which is great. I think we have great powder on the far side, we, and we've good guys to come in, the likes of Killian Spillane, Tony Brosnan, Michal Burns. All those guys are quality players. So if if someone isn't performing, we can introduce good good players to to make an impact. I know Sorry, you, but the only yeah, thing I will say, um, this Kerry defence hasn't been tested yet. And if you look at the Dublin team without Con Conor Callaghan, I mean, they were, you go back to the Cork game, they had no threat of a goal against, against the Cork team that's quite average. Um, so, again, who, Mayo without Conroy and without Ryan Dunahoo, uh, Keen O'Connor just back, where is the threat there? So, this Kerry defence has not been tested uh, to any limit as far as I'm concerned yet. And considering Galway have got 11 goals, 83 points. Yeah in the championship i think they've got two goals in all the last couple of games four goals against leitrim like they they can get goals comer comer just seems to be coming into the right form so 
the Irish series are going to ask questions of our defence. But look, in fairness to Foley and Morley have improved. I think it's the first time we've had a three and a six that are playing to a level where th that they should be, especially Foley. I, I'm very impressed with Foley this year, but this is going to be the ultimate test for him on Sunday. Kevin, do you have the weapons to, to te really test that Kerry defence? As you said, if it hasn't been maybe properly road tested now, they could potentially sleepwalk into a final. Do you think you have the attacking weapons to really hurt them Sunday? I do, yeah. I mean, we, we have the potential up front. Uh, if the space is in there, Robert Finnerty's kicking pints for fun if he gets space. Well, he got no space against Jerry whatsoever. And I know the way Galway set up, he, he was back in the full, the full forward line, or full back line, should I say, on numerous occasions where he's not going to do any damage. So, uh, Comer at the minute, as you can see, is flying. His first touch is brilliant. He's not dropping the first ball. That gives him, he's, you know, he's really quick on, on the turn. And you have Shane Walsh, obviously, who was there as well. And I'd say Thomas Sullivan will probably go after Shane and he'll give him really, really close attention. But then again, that's taken another man, good, good carry man to one side as well. So, but we have, the, we have the full forward line to do damage if the space is there. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how much space will be there. And do you get the sense that there's even more to come from this Galway team? Like in the semi-final, Rob Finnerty, I don't think he got on the score sheet. Matthew Tierney had scored, I think, three against Derry. He didn't, or sorry, against Armagh. He didn't get on the score sheet. Paul Conroy, I think, maybe he got one. But the point being that it feels like there probably are even more scores in this team than we saw in the semi-final, Kevin. Yeah, but the semi-final, if you, if you look at the 12 forwards that started that day, could you name other than one anyone you could say had an impact in that game? None. So Damien Comer was the only forward that had an impact, and that's down to the, the, the zonal defence on both sides. And unfortunately, if that's what happens Sunday or any other day, that's the way it's going to be. So it's about having the patience to stay at what you're at, keep working. You mightn't be a scorer, it mightn't be lovely to watch, but I guarantee you those guys don't care what will happen once they get the little Kelty cross coming out on Sunday. So it depends on what way it sets up. Um, it's fine to say that we've more potential than that. You probably don't when you're up against a team. That was there. And again, to be fair to Derry, they were up against a total defensive Galway team. It wasn't all Derry. Galway were completely defensive as well. You know, it, it took out all the, the big names from Derry because there's just no space. And that's something that, you know, Clifford, you know, Shea, they'll have to deal, deal with that Sunday. And uh, how long can they deal with that? Will, will, will they be patient enough with that? If they get a few early scores, you know, if Gary get early scores, like Derry went 3-0 up, Galway would have to come out and play against Kerry, where they could, you know, take their time against Derry. Derry weren't good enough to, 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 to finish it off. Kerry will be. Seamus, where can Kerry get at Galway? Um, yeah, look, to be fair, we, we've all spoken about their forwards. Uh, like, uh, Kerry forwards are... A, a, in any given Sunday, everyone can can be a match winner. Uh, David Clifford has seems to have found his form again. Paddy, his brother, had a fantastic second half, um, and I think Paddy ha will have a very big bearing in this game on Sunday because obviously Galway are going to set up stalls. They're going to get bodies back, but we need to get guys in midfield getting on ball, quick dinky balls into that pocket, running off the shoulder, and the the, the idea that we're going to get fast ball into David Clifford. If we don't transition fast, we're going to be in trouble here because Galway are going to get to bodies back and we're going to be going lateral across the field so in an ideal world if we can get bodies back transition fast on the turnovers that couple of turnovers that they did against Dublin get the ball down and into space into David Clifford we, 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 we have a great chance but if it's a slow build up and we're going over across the field we're going to be in trouble because that will suit Dublin or Galway down to the ground um, but I genuinely feel we have very very good forwards uh, that can punish any team any given Sunday, but we need to get the ball in as fast as we physically can. I also feel we have a stronger bench. I think we have a very, very strong bench, both defensively, we have options in the, for defence, we have options for forwards. I don't think Galway's bench is as strong as it should be. Um, there's players there that could be there, um, but I genuinely feel, if you're looking back over your shoulder at the bench at the minute, I don't think the strength is in, de in that depth. So I would say, Definitely, Kerry, stronger forwards, stronger panel, and more, more options to come in. I would worry about midfield. I think the two Galway midfielders are exceptional players. They're up and down, they're box to box. And if we give those guys the space to run into the 45 yard line, 35 yard line, they can take great scores. They've been doing it all year. And I think they could really hurt us. McDaid and uh, Paul Clancy or, 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 or Conroy are absolutely flying at the minute. So it's, it, I think it'll be an intriguing game. It could come down to very small uh, margins, but ultimately I still think we have, we, we have quality forwards. If we can get fast ball in, we can do damage. Does any part do you think, Seamus, I know, you know you probably won't allow yourself to think this, but with the age profile of Clifford, with the age profile of Sean O'Shea, Gavin White and many, many more, 
that if he can get over the line Sunday that the, that the dam will burst over the next five or, five or six years and that this team who haven't none, like there's only three of them as you say and Paul Murphy have all Ireland at the moment but that they could end up with a, with a fair whack of them if they can get over the line Sunday I, I don't know Michael to be fair look the first one was always the hardest one to win. Uh, I knew that for myself, 97, and you know, the pressure to get that, get over the line, to get one Celtic cross in your pocket, and I think every year is so different. But y y over the last few years, underage football, we haven't won an under-21 in the last five years. We won five minors. We got absolutely, we've got a few players from it, but we should be getting more, to be fair. Since then, Cara Finn have won 2015, 18, 19, and 20. The, the Miners won this year, the Galway won the, uh, the under-21s in 2020, they won the, in the, the Sigerson last year. There's a lot of box ticking there, so there's, there has to be a lot of talent there. I just think at the minute, our underage, we're not getting the conveyor belt since the David Cliffords, since the Sean Shays, since they've come in. We haven't gained an awful lot. And if we lost to Dublin uh, last Sunday, you'd be kind of scratching your head going home in the car and saying, where, where in God's name do we go from here? Because it's not like that we have 10 under 20 players biting at the chop at home to get into the panel. We don't. So we have what we have. And, you know, if we win this year, absolutely, it's fantastic. But there's not going to be 10 guys knocking at the door next year on that dressing room saying, I want that number 15 jersey or I want that number five jersey. I think, you know, and you need that. You need that. So. Look, obviously, we're going all hell out to win that competition, but to say that we're going to be knocking at the door for the next couple of years, it doesn't work like that. And I think the only way you can have confidence in doing that is your underage structure. Dublin did it. Dublin totally took over the under-21 competition for a number of years. They had a huge conveyor belt coming through, and that's why they won all the all they did. Yeah. Kevin, do you think that Galway have the leaders in the dressing room to get across the line on Sunday? Well, not be smart, but we're going to know that Sunday. Uh, like, um, I suppose, you see, the one slight worry, I wanted to worry, but we don't really know where Derry or Armagh are actually at. If this was a, a Tyrone team in their pump, or even a, a Monaghan team going strong three or four years ago, or a Donegal team, the Michael Murphys of this world, going well and strong with a proven tradition, uh, you'd have to say by taking those guys out, you would have proven leaders. But I'm not so sure, like, but you have to look at Derry, it's their first Ulster Championship in, what, 18 years? Is that where they wanted to get to this year, but well, you know, does it, have they achieved their goal early? Um, then you have Armagh who couldn't win Ulster, and Ulster doesn't look to be the strongest this year, so, like, albeit they've only one year played in, in Division Division 1, Jerry are, are in Division 2, so we see Mayo have regressed, you know, without the forward line of Conroy, Ryan Donoghue, and you take out your Parsons, take out Keith Higgins, take out Colin Boyle, they wouldn't have the leaders they had in the last four years, so, this game is a massive barometer as to where the standard of football is at. So, you know, so what about leaders? Um, the only line you can look at this year, with both teams, is actually Mayo form. Kerry played Mayo, Galway played Mayo. And if you're, go, if you're on the horses for the go next week, you'd say that Galway beat Mayo by a point, Kerry beat them by eight points. And, you know, when, when Galway played them, I think Durkham wasn't, wasn't playing to Mark Shane well. So, it's just, it's really hard to know where the standard of football at the minute. There's a transition period where Dublin has stepped back and who's hungry enough, who's good enough to step forward. Um, so it's just look at next Sunday, we'll see where the leadership is at. It's the first time you're going to say that from a goalie point of view, they're playing a top division one side for, for a number of years. And we'll have to see how they stand up on that. Okay, well, I think it's time to move towards prediction time. Kevin, who's going to win this game and why? I'm going to go for a goalie and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, because 2018, 2018 had a group of players from Kerry, and I don't see much changes in the personnel. I think Paddy Clifford has come in. Um, you've lost Crowley at centre back, so it would accrue your ligament. Uh, James Juno was gone. David Moore is 34 now. Gini's not at his best. Uh, O'Brien isn't at his best. His speed isn't as, as much as it was there. Um, so I just feel that you know losing to Cork 2000. It was in their own 2021, but they expect to win both games. If Galway can just push us out, stay tight, and there's you're coming down the stretch, the doubts I think will cop into Kerry's, Kerry's heads. Okay, well, I think we have a question from the audience. We'll come to you, Seamus, in your prediction in a, in a moment. But Michael, I think you have someone down in the audience. Yeah, we have a Galway based question here, Barry from Atten A quick question, a tactical question, I think, Barry. Uh, evening, lads, how are you? Uh, I just have one question about the midfield battleground. I like to hear the lads really what their opinion would be about it who, who, who do you think really would be the strongest I suppose in, in midfield who, who could come out on top of the midfield battle really 
we go to the, the big midfielder on the right, Kevin Walsh there. Who do you think will come out on top in the midfield battle and why? Uh, I expect that Morn will take off Carl Conroy. Um, yeah. I know they're talking about putting Jack yeah. Barry on Conroy to stop his point taking, but I think Morn will go on Conroy. He's 34, Conroy's 33. Uh, I think Kerry will push up, which will be an aerial battle, and I think Morden will want to be on Conroy for that. Uh, McDade will probably be marked by Jack Barry. McDade seems to be in great form. Um, kicked some great scores, vital scores. Even though there was a time in the match I was looking down in the earlier part and I was saying, geez, where's McDade going to get involved in this game? And all of a sudden, bang, he came into it. So his confidence levels are going to be really, really high. But you know, what could, call, what could call this is the kick-out strategy. And I think we don't talk enough about kick-outs. Um, you know more about, about, the, about the Kerry kick-out strategy, but um, I hope Galway worked a little bit more on, on the kick-out strategy, because it seems to be just bombed down the middle, and I think Galway haven't met a, a midfielder like Morden with the capability of catching ball. So I'm just hoping that there's not too much in the air, because I, I think he can hurt us in the air. Yeah, well, well, what do you think, Seamus, for the midfield battle? Yeah, I think I spoke about it earlier, and I, I, I'm very impressed with the two Galway midfielders, and I think they're a bigger threat going forward uh, as opposed to the Kerry midfielders. I think Kerry midfielders are your traditional midfielders that they want. They will certainly try to press the Galway kick, uh, goalkeeper to, to go along, uh, and, and they'll want to have an area battle outside in the middle of the field. In terms of Shane Ryan's kicks, Shane will want to go along as well, but if the short one is on, he'll give a chart. He's no hesitation to giving it out to a wing back or a corner back if he's left free. But I think it'll be, look, I think the, back in our time, Kevin, midfield was a huge, it was a huge battle and where it was the adage, whoever won middle of the field invariably won if you'd go forwards. But the game has changed so much uh, and, and, and the fact that the goalies are so good now pinpointing kickouts and going short, it kind of takes that context out. But in terms of scoring context, Galway have ticked the box. In score, in terms of, of the aerial battle, I think Kerry will come out in that one, you know. But look, it's just one facet of the whole game. I think, you know, it may have a, 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 a I don't think it'll have an overall impact on it. I think the major impact here is how Kerry are going to deal with a very, very compact defence from Galway. I think, Michael, you have another question from our crowd here in Anpukon. Yeah, Trades from St. Michael's Trades. I think you have a question. We'll aim at Seamus first. Yeah. I suppose talking to Kerry supporters up here and that, you know, all the pressure seems to be on the Kerry lads this year because they're talking about the fact they haven't brought an All-Ireland home in eight years. It's a period of famine. Um, supporters in Galway don't seem to be putting a lot of pressure on our lads. You know, it's bonus territory being in an All-Ireland. How as a player or even a manager do you prevent the lads from absorbing that pressure? Like, how do you alleviate that pressure before they're going out on the pitch? Yeah, it's a very fair point, but I think those boys are kind of used to it, to be fair. Uh, you know, in 2019, there was pressure on them to win that All-Ireland, and they didn't. And, uh, you know, I, I, we lost to Tyrone, we lost to Cork in a very funny, bad game. But pressure, I think, comes with the with the jersey. And uh, if you're playing poorly, you're going to get it. We spoke about Paul earlier on, and, and I suppose the, the criticism he had with the, with the supporters. I, I've been so critical on performances. So I think those players have gone, are well used to it. They're well used to it. Like, club level and they know the expectations that are there and I think you know with the, when, once the ball is thrown in you just have to get on with it and I think a player if you're mentally strong you just switch off you know your role you know what you have to do you're in a close group and you you kind of really cut out all the social media you cut out even what your parents or whoever you're living with you're in that little bubble of what you have to do what you're going to help and your teammates and it's irrelevant really what, what pressure has been put on the outside because it's, it's of no benefit. I think, I think both teams are well prepared and they're going to go into that final ultimately wanting to walk up to Hogan's stand and you know, they're going to be, it's, it's irrelevant what pressure is going to be put on the outside because it, it doesn't go, it won't, it won't reach them. Michael, do we have another question? We do, we have, we have one more question here, yeah? Uh, hi, uh, from Anna Down and Calistran area, uh, just for Seamus and Kevin, uh, I heard on one of the podcasts there during the week, uh, kind of from Paddy Andrews and James O'Donoghue, that they were saying for Galway to kind of win on Sunday, they were saying to have uh, Comer, Walsh and Finnerty on the, the inside line, you know how they kind of get them on their counter-attack. Would you have 10 or 12 players coming back, or how many would you have Coming back. Sorry, I can't hear guys. Yeah, just ba basically that when it, when uh, Galway are defending, how many players will go back behind the ball? She's kind of asking, do they need to keep Comer and Finnerty and Walsh up the whole time, or do they need to bring all 15 behind the ball like they did against Derry? 
uh, are against Derry, yeah. I, I think that kind of changes depending on the... Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you, but I, I think Galway... Galway, Galway appeared to be leaving Comer up against Derry, uh, and they're leaving... Uh, Shane Walsh is even going back, but he, he transitions up very fast. But I, I would say you have to leave Comer. You have to have at least two people up uh, at all stages to have a target when it breaks down to, to have a, an option for an outlet. Because if you don't, if you're 15 behind the ball, it's just insane. But I think Galway, Galway won't need that. I think, I think the two wing forwards, the centre forward, Shane Walsh may go back, but I think they'll leave Finnerty and they'll leave Comer. I think they're both very good scorers. And if they get that space, Finnerty is a, a really lovely kicker of the ball. And Comer is just such a physically strong fella. And he's a scorer, he's a goal, he's a goal getter. And he'll ask serious questions of the full back. So I, if I had that team, I'd leave those two boys. I wouldn't be asking him to go back anymore. But you're asking the rest of the fellas to work their socks off. Yeah, what would you do, Kevin? In terms of setting yeah, up? Yeah, no, I think it's vital to keep two, two, or if not, at least three. <clears throat> Sorry, at least two, maybe three. But, I, but there's a trick to that. If you're going to leave three up or two up, you can't have three or four sweepers. And, and that's the problem. So in the first half against Derry, I, the first 25 minutes, we had nobody up. We, had, we actually had nobody up at all, which meant we were very slow transitioning, which meant we had one point scored after 29 minutes. So the balance here is how many sweepers you need behind the front line of defence, and God, we have three or four. In my opinion, there's probably enough in one, two maximum, because if you put three or four behind, you're bringing back two more to, to get the line in front fully filled. And that's a problem in Crow Park, because Crow Park is wider. And if you don't fill that defensive line, there's an extra half yard to cut through, and all of a sudden, your front nine are turning backwards, running behind the ball. So that's a problem. So it's just to get that balance on the outlet pass. Because when you turn a team over, if you're too slow to transition, the other team will either dispossess you in the wrong place, or they'll be back setting up a defense, and you've got to break it through. So to answer your question, I'd like to have two or three up. Okay, and just to finish up this segment with this panel, Seamus, we didn't get your prediction yet. Who's going to win and why? Yeah, well, obviously, I, with my Kerry hat on, I'll, I'll have to go. I don't want to be shot here or anything, but obviously, I'll, um, I, I'll be rooting for Kerry. And, and I, I still think Kerry will just... A hesitant vote to Kerry to the sense that... Um, I've spoken about it earlier. I think beating Dublin was a massive, massive, uh, massive win. Not the strongest Dublin team, but it was huge to get that one over the line. And they showed a bit of grit. They stuck in. Things didn't go well for them in the second half. We should have been up eight or nine points. We're the far better team in the first half. But in the second half, we stuck in there. We gave away a goal, but we, we stuck in there. And another day, we could have been beaten by Dublin. They'd have kicked the ball over the bar with a last by a point. I would have been hitting down for Killarney again. We're absolutely not talking until we got to Mitchellstone. And it was serious in the face. So it was great to get that one over the line. Um, I still feel that we have a very, very strong bench. We have some quality players to come in. I know Paul Ganey is getting, getting, getting long in the tooth. So is Stephen O'Brien. Jack doesn't change. I think Jack will go with the start. He's a similar team. I don't think I can't see a change. Uh, but he will he will bring in the likes of Dara Mine and he will bring in Adrian Spillane. He will bring in Tony Braz and he will bring in um, Killian Spillane. They're, they're really, really good forwards and you've you've options of both on the wing forward line and the full forward line if guys aren't playing well and they know if they're not playing well, they're going to, the Shepherd's Crook is going to come out. So there's a there's a pressure on them straight away to perform and perform for as long as you physically can anyway. And and there's a good guy coming in defensively I suppose we've concerns over Gavin White. I think Gavin probably won't start. You have the likes of probably Paul Murphy or Gavin Gavin Crowley going to fill that void. Um, we may not have as much cover in the backs if someone like um, Foley gets injured full back. I'd have concerns. So I think Kerry need everything to go right on the day. Uh, we don't need too many injuries. No, obviously in, a, in an All Ireland, if you're going to win an All Ireland, you need things to go right. But we don't want injuries to key players like Clifford or Foley. But if they play to the level they can play, if we can get ball in, we transition fast, we get fast ball in as, as, as much as we can. Be patient. No different to like to the 2014 final against Donegal, where they had to be patient, where they had to move the ball within two or three seconds, not take the ball into contact, get into a scoring place and have a go. More importantly, kill the bloody ball, not to allow counter-attack. I think if Kerry can do that, be patient, get your scores. They have scored, they have players to kick ball over the bar from 35, 40 yards out. We need to do that. We need to draw out Galway and get the likes of the David Cliffords uh, on ball then to release them but 
Uh, it's going to be a very, very close one. I genuinely feel we'll just hesitantly one or two points. I'd love to be in a dressing room with you as manager. I tell you that because it's straight down the line. There's no, uh, there's just all facts and uh, choice language at times as well. I have to say I like that too. <laughs> okay, well look, that's it from uh, Seamus and Kevin. Really brilliant to have him here, especially Seamus who drove a really long way to get up here from Kerry. We'll let him hit the road. And thank you very much as well, Kevin. If you could pass the microphones over to John and Liam who are going to join us on stage. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Okay, so John and Liam are going to join us here. Another Galway versus Kerry lineup coming up here. Michael, are you looking forward to this game on Sunday? Yeah, no, I am, yeah. I don't know if it's going to be the most open game in the world, but it's definitely going to be interesting. And I think there's an element of doubt about both teams, isn't there, really? And we're not 100% sure what we're going to get. And I think that's probably one of the most interesting aspects about it. Yeah, I mean, both teams are coming through, and we've talked about how uh, Galway... Be beat an Armagh team and a Derry team that probably aren't at the very top, top table and aren't winning titles all the time. Obviously, Derry ended their 24-year barren run in Ulster. And then, of course, Kerry coming through, beating Mayo teams and Dublin teams that didn't have some of the top forwards. So there is that element of the unexpected, John, going into this final. There is. And I mean, I, I feel, to be honest, Kerry in the, against Mayo. Mayo this year were just a pale shadow of what they have been in the last 10 years, I would say, and especially without Ryan O'Donoghue and, and, and Tommy Conroy. And I, my feeling is, to be honest, if, if, if Kerry had met Galway in that quarterfinal, Galway could have beaten them on, on that particular day. Uh, so, and then we had Dublin without Conor Callan and pushing them. So, uh, look, at, it's, it's, it's very hard maybe to compare things, but I, I, I just feel that Overall, the standard isn't maybe as high as when Dublin were at the top of the tree. Uh, I, I, you know, but I, I think I, I still think that I would I'd give Galway a chance on Sunday. Really, in the context of that, in the sense that Kerry weren't really tested until Mayo tested them maybe for a half an hour, uh, and Dublin really tested them without Conor Callaghan. Maybe I've been the wearing my maroon tinted glasses here, but that's that's what I feel, and I think that's uh, I, I'm smiling to myself actually with Kev Kevin's. Um, we all can share it now, but like Kevin was being criticised for being too defensive in his managerial time, and here he's saying now that Parik Joyce is too defensive that he's using <laughs> that he's used. So that's my takeaway from the night, anyway. Uh, uh, you know, so it's it, look at. I, I, what I'd say about that is that if you win, you're right, and if you lose, you're wrong. That's the, the that's the, the the part of management always since since day one. Uh, but I think I think Galway have a chance. I would agree with Seamus that I think Kerry have the stronger bench, and if but if Galway come through with without you know they obviously have some very good players in the bench but i think kerry shaded there but i think i think all will really have a, have, a, have a chance a real chance of this yeah and liam you you as the kerry man do you have that confidence that uh, that your county tends to have when it comes to this game confidence uh bordering on arrogance you'd say yeah um well, look, I went for the Galway job three years ago and Tariq Jais beat me to it. So um, <laughs> I obviously believe Galway were capable of doing great things and they're in an All-Ireland final now. Um, so I'm not shocked that uh, Galway have come out of the pack um, and that they're challenging the Kerrys, then Tyrone and Dublin. Um, but yeah, look, I, 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 the same as Jono, I was at the Mayo match and I was shocked at how poor Kerry were that day. And uh, I came out of it thinking they might win any All-Ireland. Um, I was happier, obviously, against Dublin. Um, but I would still say if Conor Callan was there, would we have got over Dublin? I, I have my doubts. Um, I would say Kerry have a better depth in their squad. Um, I would also say that Kerry are going to test the Galway full back line um, and the goalkeeper with high ball. Um, definitely the Armagh game. Um, Armagh got, caused a lot of problems for Galway in the last 10 minutes with high ball and Derry did not do it at all in the semi-final. So I'm expecting Kerry to do it often and early um, next Sunday and it'll be interesting to see how, how Galway cope with that. Um, but I, ju I just think Kerry might just have the edge but again um, I saw Galway against Armagh 
and I was hugely impressed with Galway's resilience that day. Armagh had a huge crowd there. They were um, booing everything that uh, Galway did and they were cheering for everything Armagh did. Um, Galway gave away a couple of very bad goals and they still showed tremendous resilience and tremendous heart and guts to um, face down the crowd and face down the Armagh team and get the result. And I, I, I saw something a little bit special in them that day. But I'm, as a Kerry man, certainly I'm not arrogant about it. I think Kerry, I hope Kerry can manage it. But um, I do think it'll be very tight. Just on that, John, we talk about the significance of the Dublin victory for Kerry. But the significance in that, that Armagh game for Galway, you know, you know, coast into victory, winning by six points. Uh, you're going into extra time then. Very easy, hang the heads. We've all seen teams do it and capitulate in extra time. But to come back out and play as well as they did in, uh, in extra time and then see it out in penalties, they would have grown significantly from that as well. And even the first half an hour against Derry as well and then finishing the way they did. Yeah, unbelievable, to be honest, because I, uh, on that particular day, I met in the McNulty at, at full time, just in the crowd. And basically, we both agreed that the momentum was with Armagh. Uh, but to show the nerves of steel that uh, Galway did in that extra time was unbelievable because Kerry, or Armagh got the third goal, Rory Grugan, and Killian McDade, like, to win an All-Ireland, some player has to come out of the woodwork. That you maybe, you know, everyone talks about Comer and Brilliant Year and Shane Walsh and, and Paul Conroy and all the rest of it. But, I, like, Killian McDade came of age in that extra time. He, he made that run with a purpose. Like, there'd be a lot of teams who would, if you let in three soft goals, which really happened to Galway that day, they'd be saying, oh, Jesus, this isn't our day. What do we have to do here? But he basically, his self-talk in his head was, what am I going to do about this? What can I do about this? And he, he ran from midfield, or the, the area near midfield, with one purpose and one purpose only, was to, to, to finish that ball to the net, and he, and he did it. So, you know, look at, we can talk here, we could talk here until midnight, but something is going to happen in this game next Sunday that we can't predict. But I think both teams have a real chance. If Galway are to win it, they're going to have to maximise every iota that's in the team. But I wouldn't put that past them. I have had the experience with Kevin's team in 98 and 01 and, and, and even 2000 when we were without two of our stalwart players in Jaff Allen and Thomas Mangan. Apart from that, we might have won three out of four as well. But anyway, I, I wouldn't expect Seamus to agree with me on that. But it's, it's, I, I, I think that there's I think that there's, there's something here. Galway have always, they won't be overawed. Yeah. And I think an All-Ireland final inspires them in the past. I hope I'm not wrong. What they have to do, what they have to do to win it, obviously, the three elephants in the room are, are David Clifford, Paddy Clifford and Sean O'Shea. And if they can hold them, if they can hold them uh, anywhere reasonable at all, I think there's a, there's a fair, I think that the Galway forward line has more potential than the Dublin forward line had against Kerry in the semi-final. So I'm basing it on that, but maybe I'm just totally optimist. But uh, I, I'd, I'd also say that if Kerry do get over the line, I think they have huge potential over the next number of years to, because they're so young that they could could dominate but maybe maybe this one might be you know the the need to get one in the bag and if if goal were level with them and are you know a point behind or a point in front with 10 or 15 minutes to go i think there's a great chance of the maroon and white coming out on top you mentioned about Killian McDade coming out of woodwork. Is there any player, they always say in an All-Ireland final, it's a couple of names maybe that you're not expecting that'll be the difference maker. From a Galway point of view, who do you think that might be? Well, yeah, and, and just as a manager going into an All-Ireland, sometimes it's the players you, you, you worry about that come up trumps, and, and sometimes the ones you don't worry about maybe have, have a poor day. Like, Rob Fennerty is... is He's playing a system maybe that is not as free-flowing as he'd like, but I think he's, he has huge potential in his, in his accuracy. Uh, and he, he has been substituted, substituted, I think, in every game. It's almost like as if it's preordained or whatever. But there's some of those games that I would have felt, I think he got, is it four or five points against Armagh? I, you'd feel almost that if he had stayed on the field, he could have been man of the match. So maybe, maybe he's, I don't want to put spook him or put any pressure on him, but I, I just admire him as a, as, a, as, a, as a young player coming through. But look at Matthew Tierney as well, had a quiet Connacht championship but came alive against Armagh, 
did had a quieter game against against uh, Derry. So there is a few there's a few woodworms and woodwork there that could come out and swing it. You know. Just on that, uh, Liam, is there anybody from you know we're always going to talk about David Clifford, Shawnee O'Shea, etc. Is there any maybe unheralded Kerry player that could be the difference? Yeah, I think the bench, the Kerry bench. Um, I, I think the Kerry bench is stronger than the Galway bench. Um, I think there are quite a few players that possibly could be on the Galway bench that are not involved. Um, Cook and a couple of more now will come to my mind in relation to that. I think Kerry have got a bench that will make a difference. Killian Spillane, I expect to see him playing. I think he could make a big difference if, he, if he's introduced. Um, I would also think Paul Murphy, um, Gavin Crowley, um, you know, the, they're, they're all quality players that have been playing at this level for a while. I think there's a lack of experience maybe in the Galway bench. So I would I'd be thinking that the bench could, we saw for Limerick last weekend, you know, the bench made the difference ultimately down the stretch. I think maybe the Kerry bench could make the difference. Who will be the main man off of that? I'll go for Killian Spillane maybe to make a big impact if he gets into the, into the, into the fray. And send Pat out on a very happy note on the Sunday game. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I, I, I wouldn't be too worried about whether Pat is happy or not. But it's, it's great to see him going, though. <laughs> <laughs> Liam, is there... Um, is the, the weight of history, the fact that Kerry have won just one All-Ireland since 2009, is that weight of expectation and history and pressure that must be weighing somewhat heavily on these Kerry players' heads. Oh, no question. I mean, the, there is serious pressure on this Kerry team. There's serious pressure on Jack O'Connor. He brought in Paddy Talley. Uh, look, as, he, as, as Seamus was saying, it, the demands down in Kerry are huge. Um, it'll all be great if they get the result. If they don't get the result, the, the win against Dublin will count for nothing. There's massive pressure on them to produce this All-Ireland now. Um, there was some big risk taken, and uh, this is payday on Sunday, and if it doesn't happen, um, it will set Kerry back in a big way. Um, so, yeah, there is, you, can, you can double the pressure, to be honest with you. It's, it's one of the biggest ones for a while, I'd say. John, when you're sending a team out for an All-Ireland, what's your mood in the dressing room? Do you, do you kind of let every player do their own thing, or do you try and get everyone hyped up or everyone relaxed? Do you have a, a system? No, no, I mean, the modern... Uh, so, some of the shots in that year till Sunday weren't my better moments. They might have been good television or whatever, but they weren't my better moments uh, at halftime, I think, in the Roscommon, uh, one of the Roscommon matches. But no, you're, you're, you're basically... It's calmness in the dressing room nowadays. You know, uh, and and you have people watching to see who might be a little worked up or whatever, and you, you try and control the the atmosphere again that they can can produce it when they get out on the field. But it's it's not a it's you know the and and as well as that, you know all the tactics that Galway and Kerry have, I'm sure they're they're well in the implanted in the players' heads at this stage because. You don't have two or three hour meetings on the Saturday night because the absorption level isn't, you know, you'll, you'll have little small groups maybe chatting among each other, but it's, it's, all, it's, it's all done one way or the other at this stage. And I suppose one other thing from an interview I think you did about 1998 was that you had found out about some post-match celebrations that uh, Kildare had been planning. <laughs> so did you use this with your players to sort of G them up that Kildare were already... You play all kind of, yeah you do like we, we we heard that that michael lester was to be taken out with a police escort after the game down to wherever the kildare boys with the cup like for the post-match function or whatever so i i let that be known as much as i could and and uh warmed it and i'd be very good friends with michael lester i'm not sure whether it was ever true or not but sure it was a good story anyway <laughs> Anything you can do to, to wind the players up. I suppose we'll start moving towards predictions time, uh, prediction time now. Uh, Liam, Kerry hat on. Is it going to be Kerry? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to give them a tentative vote. I, I think they might just get there. Um, I think Galway have done fantastic this year to get from where they were to the All-Ireland final. Um, I, I do respect that Galway are a type of team with the tradition that they can turn up in an All-Ireland final and actually win it at the first attempt. Um, but maybe they might need to lose one before they, they're ready to win one. Um, I think for Kerry, this is huge on, on Sunday. I also think that they're going to get massive confidence from not alone that they beat Dublin, but the way they beat Dublin. And um, I think they'll feed off that confidence. And um, so I'm going to give Kerry a tentative vote to, to get over the line, yeah. And John, final word to you? Ah, well, I, look, at maybe it's hope rather than 
expectation. But I, I give Galway a chance. I, I really do, when I'm, I'm pro presupposing that on the fact that they, that they can contain this triumvirate in the in the in the in the Kerry attack, and that they can be with with Kerry going down the stretch, and the pressure of not having him won in All Ireland, only won All Ireland in what is it, 14 or 15 years. Uh, Think of poor old Mayo, they haven't won one in 70 years. Like so, it's a famine in Kerry is 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 is, is, is different than a famine in Mayo. But no, I, I do, and I really would love. And I I always said it to the teams when I was in charge of Galway that they could come from nowhere and have an All Ireland one before people realise that maybe this is the year as well. Wouldn't it be some crack in Ampukan next Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, if Galway do get the job done and the race is on in Bally Riff for the week as well? By God, there would be no one seeing straight in this county for a week or two. After. We might be back down ourselves even. We might. We might wander in. We might wander in. Look, well, that's it from our show here from Ampukan, sponsored by uh, Heineken. Delighted to be with you. We've obviously had a great time with John O'Mahony, Liam Kearns, Seamus Moynihan, uh, Kevin Walsh, myself, Shane Stapleton, and Michael Verney. Thank you very much. The audience has been brilliant here. We'll get you again.